under the theme towards prosperous and sustainable Africa, renewable energy and industrialization to be the drivers of industrialization in Africa. Uh, the topic is green industrialization, leveraging the new energy technologies and investing in Africa's renewables. Uh, these renewable energy sources, geothermal, wind power, hydroelectric, solar systems, uh, so that Africa can get enough energy and electricity for industrialization. On behalf of the Secretary General, Dr. Hemogen Sengemana, the Secretary General, we welcome you. Uh, and I say present his apologies, but he's with us. He's currently at, in Cairo for the Inter-African Trade Fair that has been taking place. And the role of standardization has been uh, one of the agenda items. So it was not possible for him to miss. And currently is on uh, a session. We have our co-host, uh, uh, Mr. Taibi, the director of Imanor. And then we have our moderator, uh, Mr. Lamy, who is also from Aymanor. Uh, today's session, we have the opportunity to have about six panelists to talk about this webinar session. And the webinar session, as you can see, uh, we have uh, both private sector, we have the ministry regulators, we have experts, and we have panelists from different regions. Uh, our host, Dr. Nsengemana, our co-host, uh, Mr. Taibi, our moderator, Mr. Tariq, and then our first panelist, Mr. Peter Wayaki, uh, uh, who is also going to talk on behalf of the ASO Central Secretariat and ASO Standardization Work. We have uh, Ms. Sarah, uh, uh, from also Morocco in this case. And then we have uh, Mr. Mohamed uh, El Ahuri, also from Morocco, as you can see. Then we have uh, Mr. Mohamed Homed, also from Morocco. As you can see, our webinar sessions nowadays, we want to go deeper into the countries to understand uh, what happens there in terms of the webinar themes and the webinar topics that we have. And then we have from the Middle East, uh, engineer Mohammed Altair, who is also been uh, championing the issues of uh, energy, renewable energy uh, revolution in the Middle East. And we also have from USA, because also USA is also championing the issue of uh, green uh, green industrialization or green uh, renewable energy revolutions. So these are our panelists of today. We will give them enough opportunity. You will see from the background information uh, what we are talking about, Agenda 2063 and the SDGs, all campaigning for renewable energy in terms of uh, climate change uh, uh, challenges, mitigations, and also facilitate sustainable development uh, within the continent and the world over. So these are the crucial policy issues, the policy matters that is driving growth in terms of renewable energy sources. Our background information also tells us how Africa, we are very deficient in terms of electricity and which affects us in one way or the other as highlighted. And that is why it is also important for Africa to focus on the issues of renewable energy. Uh, we can't forget about the problem of the health that our women, mostly and children uh, who are in the department of the kitchen and the cooking uh, suffer from the firewood, the charcoal, uh, and the death that normally is uh, indicated. So the renewable energy, there is a, a lot of opportunity for Africa uh, to uh, harness the renewable energy system as I let, highlighted it here, the solar capacity, the hydro, the wind, and the geothermal power. So it is up to Africa through coordinations, through cooperations, and through the implementations of the uh, Agenda 2030 and Agenda uh, 2063 to use the opportunities uh, to move forward. 
So these are just some highlights of what is going on in Africa and what we can achieve. There is a uh, real potential. There are policy documents. Uh, so it is up to Africa now to move on. Uh, these are some of the highlights, the renewable energy that we are talking about and that we are going to get from uh, uh, the presenters. Uh, these are some of the key initiatives that African governments, uh, the African uh, uh, or the regional organizations, we have the Auda NEPAD, we have the African Union itself, we have the FDB pushing around and the benefits that we get from this renewable energy. Standardization cannot be left out because from standardization, we have the issues of safety, the issues of quality, the issues of trade. So a regulatory framework must be taken care of in this case. And these are some of the initiatives that HASO has taken in terms of this. And you see, we, we are cooperating with the GSO, the OSP, in these uh, uh, initiatives. We also have ASO TC61 on eco-labeling and sustainability. And we have also been doing a lot of awareness creation with the ANSI. So we have IMANOR, which is doing its part also in terms of standardization and has done a lot in terms of regulatory framework at the uh, national level. And we are going to get this information shortly. Uh, our webinar today gives us the opportunity to discuss how uh, Africa's industrialization agenda and as manufacturing, focusing on the uh, focusing on the challenges that we have in terms of electricity and how we can use uh, the renewable energies to move forward. As we also look at policy issues, we have the specific objectives that we will see at the end of the day. So, with that, uh, I would want to take this opportunity to introduce, already we have introduced our host. Uh, uh, we want to introduce uh, Mr. Taibi, who is our uh, co-host. Mr. Taibi is an industrial uh, process engineer, currently the director of IMANOR. He has held the position of director of IMANOR since 2030, uh, when the institute was created. Uh, Mr. Taibi has been involved in standardization activities since 1989. Uh, that's a long time uh, with this experience. So he then headed the standardization and certification division uh, of the Ministry of Industry for 16 years. Mr. Taibi has been presenting Morocco since 1996 in international and regional standardization activities. He chaired the first French-speaking network for social responsibility and participated in several international regional activities related to standardization and certification. Uh, Mr. Taibi has also contributed to implementation of various actions aimed at promoting standardization and certification in Morocco. He has also acted as an expert mandated by international organizations for technical assistance for African countries. And finally, uh, Mr. Taibi is a member of the group of national experts recognized by international organization for standardization, that's ISO in the face of social responsibility and environmental management. Uh, we take this opportunity to welcome Mr. Taibi as the co-host to say uh, a word of welcome and some few remarks. Mr. Taibi, kindly, thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe. I will uh, speak French. Don't, if you, you can change the, for, for uh, uh, speaking uh, French, you can use uh, the, uh, the system to have a direct translation. Donc, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, je, je voudrais tout d'abord uh, exprimer mes vite rem remerciements à Larsou, à son secrétaire général et à Philippe en particulier d'avoir organisé ce webinaire conjointement avec l'IMANOR. Euh, bien sûr, je félicite l'ARSO pour cette initiative d'organiser des webinaires et de créer cet espace de communication et de partage permettant ainsi aux différents pays africains euh, et à notre continent de découvrir les nouveautés, les actualités et, et les différents enjeux de la norme et de la certification, mais surtout de tracer des objectifs communs pour agir ensemble dans le cadre de, de, de la mise en place des mesures qui nous permettront de maîtriser les différents aspects 
qui relève de la responsabilité des organismes de normalisation. Je, je, je souhaite la bienvenue, bien sûr, aux différents participants qui ont bien voulu réserver ce temps pour aussi nous écouter, pour partager avec nous leurs préoccupations, leurs idées, leurs euh, aussi point de vue sur la, 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 la thématique d'aujourd'hui. Je remercie également les, les panélistes qui ont bien voulu aussi se mobiliser pour pouvoir animer des, 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 des conférences autour, autour de ce thème choisi par, par, par l'ARSO. C'est un thème qui est très important, donc qui, qui est aussi pour le Maroc est un thème d'actualité. Et nous avons veillé à vous proposer des panélistes de, 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 de haut niveau euh, qui représentent les, les, principales, les principaux acteurs de l'énergie au Maroc. Nous avons bien entendu notre ministère de l'énergie, le ministère de l'énergie ou de la transition énergétique, qui est l'acteur et le responsable de la mise en œuvre de la stratégie nationale de l'énergie, qui va partager avec nous les grandes lignes de sa stratégie. Nous avons un acteur aussi très important, qui est l'ERISEN, qui est euh, engagé dans l'énergie solaire particulièrement, mais qui a d'autres projets aussi qui sont en relation avec les énergies renouvelables. Ils, ont, ils vont partager avec nous leur expérience. Un autre acteur très, très, très important, qui est l'Agence marocaine de l'efficacité énergétique, donc qui va aussi intervenir pour pouvoir euh, partager avec nous ses projets, ses points de vue et c'est les éléments qui, qui estiment importants à partager avec les participants. Et on aura bien sûr un débat qui va nous permettre de, 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 de s'aligner sur les tendances internationales et sur les exigences internationales. Au Maroc, nous avons adhéré à l'Arceau euh, de, depuis une, euh, plus de, 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 de quatre ans et nous, avons, nous sommes engagés dans plusieurs comités techniques. Nous sommes aujourd'hui membres d'une trentaine de comités de l'Arceau, de comités et sous-comités. Nous avons mobilisé beaucoup d'experts marocains qui sont impliqués dans les travaux de l'Arceau parce qu'on croit beaucoup à la norme africaine, à une norme harmonisée au niveau africain qui va nous permettre de se positionner, de positionner, de positionner l'entreprise africaine sur la scène du commerce international. Nous avons aussi, on collabore avec l'ARSO pour se doter d'outils suffisants d'évaluation de la conformité basée sur les pratiques internationales. Nous avons le, suffisamment, la, tout, tous les pays africains, nous avons le potentiel pour pouvoir intégrer ces, ces, ces disciplines, intégrer ces pratiques et transposer les normes internationales et européennes, mais, mais également être l'acteur de ces normes au niveau international pour ne pas rester en position de le subir, mais aussi surtout d'agir pour les orienter dans le sens ou dans l'intérêt de nos pays africains. Nous avons également euh, beaucoup de, de projets qui visent à renforcer les, 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 les actions qui vont aider à la construction de la ZLECAF, de la zone de libre-échange africaine. Donc les normes constitueront des références de base pour cette construction et qui vont faciliter la, la mise en place et l'édification de cette zone de, de, de libre-échange. Et on compte beaucoup sur l'ARSO et on confirme notre disposition à participer avec l'ARSO, la disposition de, des opérateurs, des parties prenantes marocaines à faire partie de l'ARSO, pour, pour, à faire partie des actions ou à contribuer à la mise en œuvre des actions de l'ARSO qui visent à consolider ou à bien se positionner, pas uniquement pour la construction de cette, de cette zone de libre-échange africaine, mais également pour trouver une place dans le commerce international et dans les échanges internationaux. Nous avons beaucoup de projets qui sont en relation avec le thème d'aujourd'hui, qui en plus des normes qui sont aujourd'hui validées, adoptées et mises en œuvre. Nous avons des projets de certification. Je citerai quelques projets, par exemple, qui sont en relation avec ce domaine. Le, la certification des, 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 des équipements, des énergies renouvelables en collaboration avec les RISEN, on est en train de, fina de, de finaliser un projet pour permettre la, la, la certification ou l'évaluation de, de la conformité de ces équipements. Nous avons également euh, l'étiquetage énergétique, donc nous avons beaucoup d'équipements qui sont soumis à des obligations réglementaires d'étiquetage énergétique. L'IMANOR pourrait intervenir pour aider les pouvoirs publics, aider les institutions concernées à travers l'utilisation de la certification et de la validation des déclarations liés et qui sont euh, dans, sur l'étiquette qui est apposée sur les équipements consommants de l'énergie. Donc, nous, nous avons un projet et qui sera partagé avec les institutions concernées pour pouvoir lui donner euh, la vie et surtout donner un sens à toute initiative qui pourrait intéresser les opérateurs marocains et les administrations marocaines. Nous avons également 
euh, un projet de décarbonation, de vérification des bilans carbone qui sont directement des demandeurs de l'énergie renouvelable. Aujourd'hui, l'énergie n'est pas utilisée uniquement pour rationaliser les dépenses ou la facture énergétique, mais également pour inscrire notre action dans le cadre du mouvement mondial de décarbonation et de maîtrise des changements climatiques. Nous, avons, nous sommes engagés aujourd'hui dans la mise en place d'un système de vérification des bilans carbone et bientôt on va euh, démarrer un système de vérification qui permettrait aux entreprises de, de, de valider leur déclaration en carbone afin de s'en servir au niveau national et au niveau international. Nous avons aussi des, pro, des, des, des systèmes de certification qui sont euh, opérationnels aujourd'hui et qui, sont, qui concourent tous, tous vers la, la, la maîtrise de, de l'utilisation de l'énergie, à savoir le, le, le système de management, le, la certification du système de management de l'énergie basé sur la 50001, les systèmes de certification de, de l'environnement, le système de l'eau, donc tout est basé sur les, 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 les énergies renouvelables, les, les, les ressources naturelles, etc. Et on compte beaucoup travailler avec l'ARSO pour pouvoir euh, concrétiser, ou généraliser, ou partager, ou mutualiser les différentes expériences entre les différents pays africains. Chaque pays, chaque organisme a une certaine expérience dans, dans le, le domaine, domaine l'intéressant. Donc, pour pouvoir optimiser, aller plus vite, on a intérêt à travailler ensemble. Et je vous confirme la, la, la disposition du Royaume du Maroc, de, de l'Imanor et de toutes les institutions concernées à collaborer avec l'ARSO pour travailler ensemble avec les, les différents collègues africains. Donc, voilà pour en ce qui concerne l'introduction de l'Imanor. Et je passerai la parole à, à M. Alami, Hussein euh, Alami qui est chef de service au sein de l'IMANOR pour assurer la modération de ce webinaire. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Taibi, for the introductions and for the welcoming remarks and also for explaining the situation in uh, Morocco. Uh, we take this opportunity to welcome our moderator of today, Mr. Tariq Kalami. Uh, I think our interpreter will read this loudly uh, in English so that everybody gets it. Uh, as you have already seen, uh, uh, Mr. Tariki works for Aymanor, Uh, in the energy department, and uh, he's the one who is in charge. So he's the one who will take us through the plenary sessions right now that we are going to have. So with this, I want to, introduce, to welcome Mr. Taibi, uh, uh, sorry, Mr. Alami, to take over and take us through the uh, plenary sessions that we are going to have. And welcome all the six uh, panelists of today. Thank you, Mr. Alami, and uh, we welcome you on this plenary session. Thank you. I just have the, the right to, I didn't have the right to activate my, my mic. So uh, for the remain of the, the presentation, I will ask to, to have my presentation in French. So please uh, activate the inter interpretation in French. Je souhaiterais donc d'abord vous souhaiter la bienvenue à ce webinaire qui va, porter sur, euh, euh, qui va porter sur le thème de Vérinifric, prospère et durable, énergie renouvelable et industrialisation verte. Je souhaiterais me présenter, donc je suis Alami Hassan Tarek, je suis chef de service euh, de l'énergie, eau et développement durable au département de normalisation à l'Imanor, donc de formation ingénieur d'état en électromécanique. Euh, donc j'ai suivi donc, une expérience 
dans le domaine de la fabrication mécanique avant de rejoindre l'Imana en tant que chargé des, tra des travaux de normalisation, et ainsi que euh, du suivi des travaux de normalisation euh, dans le domaine de l'énergie, de l'électrotechnique, de l'environnement, du management et du développement durable au sein des instances internationales et régionales en lien avec ces aspects. Donc, euh, le programme, comme l'a souligné M. le directeur et M. Philippe Okongou, donc, il est riche en euh, présentations. Donc, on a six présentations en, en total. Euh, donc, euh, la première présentation sera animé par M. Peter Wayaki, expert en énergie dans le domaine de l'analyse, de, de l'optimisation des systèmes énergétiques. Donc, euh, M. Wayaki est titulaire d'un master en conception des dynamiques des systèmes énergétiques de l'Institut indien des technologies de Madras. Et il a aussi contribué activement à des projets de recherche novateurs visant à faire progresser les solutions énergétiques durables, principalement l'hydrogène vert. Il a collaboré étroitement avec une équipe multidisciplinaire de chercheurs et de membres du corps professionnel. Donc, il, est aussi employé, il a été aussi employé temporaire au niveau du secrétariat central de l'Orso, où il facilitait l'harmonisation des normes dans le cadre des divers comités techniques. M. Peter, aujourd'hui, va animer une présentation sur la transition vers les énergies renouvelables, comment réduire la dépendance aux combustibles fossiles traditionnels en exploitant le potentiel des énergies renouvelables de l'Afrique et les pôles énergétiques intra- et interrégionaux, tout en facilitant les solutions de combustibles propres pour les produits et procédés de cuisson et le commerce de l'énergie entre les pays africains et le rôle de la normalisation et de l'assurance qualité. Monsieur Peter, vous avez dix minutes pour faire votre présentation et merci. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Donc, j'ai désactivé le partage. Vous pouvez partager votre écran. Merci. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Peter Oyaki. And... Uh, I'll be making my presentation on uh, just a moment on the renewable energy transition, and we'll be having a quality assurance approach to harnessing Africa's green energy potential while lowering the dependence on fossil fuels and facilitating clean fuel solutions for cooking within Africa. So uh, I'll just give a brief introduction on. Uh, ARSO as an organization, and uh, it is Africa's intergovernmental standards body, which was formed by the African Union and uh, UNECA in 1977 in Accra, Ghana. It engages in the harmonization of standards and development of uh, conformity assessment procedures, and currently there are 43 Af African governments that are uh, members and are represented by their national standard bodies. As an organization, uh, the vision of ARSO is to be an excellent standardization institute, institution that promotes an, a quality culture in support for trade, industrialization, and sustainable development in Africa. Additionally, uh, our values are integrity, accountability, excellence, and uh, inclusivity, while our mission is to, pro uh, is to facilitate industrialization together with intra-African and global trade altogether by providing harmonized standards and conformity assessment procedures. ARSO's mandates uh, as per the constitution are to harmonize uh, national and sub-regional standards as African standards and issue the necessary recommendations to member bodies for this purpose. Additionally, it initiates and coordinates the development of African standards with reference to products which are peculiar, uh, which are of peculiar interest to Africa. Thirdly, it encourages and facilitates uh, adoption of uh, international standards by member bodies, and promotes the faci and facilitates exchange of expert information and cooperation through training of personnel in standardization activities. It also coordinates the views of its members in international organizations for standardizations and also creates uh, the appropriate bodies in addition to the organs of the organization. So just as a brief introduction of the, on the energy transition and the state of play, 
We know that reaching net zero emissions requires a complete transition uh, or transformation on how we power our daily lives, as well as the global economy. Of the 17 uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, the energy transition is well captured uh, in the UN SDG 7, which uh, targets affordable and clean energy transition. Uh, the main uh, targets for the UN SDG 7 are uh, universal ac uh, access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy access, increased share of renewable energy mix in the grid, as well as the improvement of uh, in energy efficiency. In summary, uh, we can have the three Ds of transition being the de decarbonization, the democratization, and digitalization of energy systems. Just to give a brief uh, overview on the global renewable energy capacity additions, from 2016 towards 2022, you'll notice that there's a considerable increase globally in terms of the renewable share. And specifically for 2022, we have solar PV, uh, which is photo photovoltaic cells, being the major contributor to the global renewable energy addition. Looking at the, the, the various renewable energy technologies that we have currently, of importance, we have solar energy, where the sun energy is converted to electricity using photovoltaic panels, or heat using uh, solar concentrators or solar dryers. We have uh, wind energy, where the kinetic energy uh, of wind is used to turn the turbines, the turbine blades, and in turn generate electricity. We have uh, biofuels, where biomass is converted into biodiesel and bioethanol, which is used as a source of heat. Uh, regarding geothermal, we know that uh, heat from the earth crust is used to convert water into steam, which in turn turns turbines for electricity production. Elect hydroelectric power, which is the most prevalent in Africa, uh, we require flow of uh, water from rivers, dams, or streams, which, term which turns turbines and thus generating electricity. Biomass is also a, 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 ren a renewable energy technology where we have uh, dire either direct combustion of the organic materials or the conversion to biogas and other briquettes which can be used to generate heat. We'll have a look at Africa's potential uh, in renewable energy. And without considering hydropower, the contribution uh, to Africa's energy mix by modern renewable energy from either solar, wind, geothermal, and modern bio, bio, bio energy this is, it's still marginal. And uh, between 2010 and 2020, uh, there was a 7% increment in the renewable energy capacity in Africa. Uh, the solar energy is now the fastest growing renewable energy source in Africa, with South Africa and Egypt being the, major, uh, the largest solar producers, accounting for over three quarters of the installed capacity as of 2020. But uh, as you can see in this uh, diagram here, you'll notice that uh, the average annual global uh, ir solar irradiation across Africa is quite high, with most of the regions being greater than 2,100 uh, kilowatt hour per meter squared. So therefore, this implies that there is still a lot of untapped pot potential in terms of the solar energy. Moving on to the wind energy, you'll notice that uh, the generation potential for Africa is about 461 gigawatts with Algeria, Ethiopia, Namibia, and Mauritania being ha having the greatest potential. Uh, this is also a map of Africa, which shows uh, our average annual wind speed. With the consideration on the north and southern parts of Africa, and you'll notice that uh, these regions have a high speed in terms of uh, average annual uh, speed of uh, over 10 meters per second. So this is still yet untapped. And uh, we also have a massive hydropower capacity in Africa, of which less than 7% has been harnessed. Uh, looking at Africa in terms of uh, geothermal energy, we have around 9,000 uh, 9, megawatts of capacity. And of this, uh, the potential, uh, only 57 megawatts has been tapped in Kenya, and less than 2 megawatts has been tapped in Ethiopia. So uh, we look at the position of Africa in the energy transition. And despite these significant strides uh, in expanding access to clean, secure, and modern energy in Africa, the growing needs uh, for the continent in terms of population and industrialization are slowing down the progress, 
and in particular access to clean cooking fuels and technologies uh, is still uh, even more precarious. Evidently, only 16% of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa's population had access to clean cooking in 2019. And most of them were living in urban areas, which left around 927 million without access to clean cooking fuels and technologies, according to IRENA and IEA. So this is evidenced uh, by this chart, where you'll notice that there's a consistent increase uh, except for the North Africa, uh, where we have an increase in uh, the people without clean cooking between 2000 and 2021, consistently increasing. But North Africa has a peculiar aspect where there's a decrease. And this is mainly because more than 90% of the population has access to clean cooking compared with just 17% that is in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the key issues that have been arising uh, due to this inadequate access to clean cooking are uh, the deplorable human health due to indoor pollution. We have environmental degradation uh, due to incomplete combustion, as well as the slowed social economic development. The role uh, of standardization in enabling the African uh, energy transition. We all know that uh, the trade and industrialization are mutually exclusive events where one facilitates the other. Achieving uh, the vision 2063 of the Africa we want, while facilitating the African continental free trade area, we need a robust quality infrastructure, which entails standards, technical regulations, conformity assessment, metrology, and accreditation. The quality infrastructure provides a bridge between the industry and the markets, and standardization will therefore enable the energy transition by facilitating uh, market access, ensuring economies of scale in terms of the technology, facilitating fitness of purpose of any technology that is uh, aiding the energy transition, encouraging the diffusion of knowledge trans and, and knowledge transfer, and finally enhancing consumer protection in terms of health and the safety of use. So we look at the role that ARSO has been playing uh, in enabling Africa's energy transition. And uh, as a background, we know that in African countries, the lack of harmonized technical requirements and regulation for clean fuel solutions has been a challenge, and this jeopardizes the safe and proper implementation and trading of cleaner fuel solutions across Africa. And without harmonized standards, there exists a technical barrier to trade. And some of, this, uh, some of the initiatives that ARSO has been uh, conducting include the arso ANSI collaboration on the webinar series for general outreach and information, mainly focusing on bioethanol fuels. Uh, we also have uh, a technical committee, uh, TC61, which focuses on eco-labeling, sustainability, and resilient systems, of which we have three key working groups, which address production processes, environmental systems, and services that are aiding sustainability and resilient systems. A, no a notable draft standard uh, that is from uh, this technical committee is the ISO DTS 14029, which addresses the mutual recognition agreements between uh, environmental product declarations, covering the necessary principles and pro procedures. Additionally, ARSO is also collaborating with uh, OSP, which is the Oil Sustainability Program, and uh, SASO, which is the uh, Saudi Standards Metrology and Quality Organization, in the harmonization of standards for clean cooking and fuel, uh, and fuel energies. As a result of these initiatives, uh, the following three Cs will be encouraged in terms of competition through the increase uh, of end-user demand for cleaner stoves and fuels, we have conformity, where we support sustainable growth market for the clean uh, cooking sector, as well as connection in uh, the market forum in terms of uh, removing the supply barriers and clean for, uh, for clean fuels and cooking. Thank you for your attention. And this uh, is the end of my presentation. Merci, Monsieur Peter, for your presentation. Donc, qui a souligné donc, le, le grand potentiel de l'Afrique en termes d'énergie renouvelable, euh, notamment tout ce qui est le potentiel en rayonnement solaire, en énergie éolienne 
euh, en énergie hydroélectrique, euh, en biomasse, en biofuel, etc. On a aussi vu donc les, les procédés de cuisson durable et le rôle de la normalisation dans la, dans la facilitation euh, du développement de ce secteur, ainsi que les comités techniques ARSO qui travaillent dans ce domaine. Donc, M. Peter, je souhaiterais donc vous poser deux questions qui sont en lien avec donc, votre présentation. Donc, quels sont, et, quels sont été les changements des combustibles fossiles traditionnels en ce qui concerne le développement durable et l'industrialisation en Afrique Et quel est le rôle stratégique de la normalisation dans la facilitation de l'efficacité énergétique de l'Afrique en ce qui concerne la production et le commerce Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, we have the three days of transition. I'll try to answer your qu first question in these three aspects, where we have digitalization of uh, the energy systems. And digitalization means that we have aspects like smart grids. We also have uh, introduction or the utilization of, uh, the, in uh, of the Internet of Things, where we have... Uh, <clears throat> We also have democratization, which means decentralization of the energy system. This is in regard of uh, Pico grids. We have solar home systems, which are very prevalent in Africa. And we also have mini grids. Uh, on the other aspect of decarbonization, we have aspects on uh, carbon capture technologies, which have been used uh, broadly. We also have uh, targets for the hard to abate sectors in the use of alternative uh, alternative energy carriers. We're looking at green hydrogen, looking at green ammonia, among others. Uh, for the role of standardization, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, we have key aspects in terms of, uh, just a moment. We have key aspects in terms of facilitating market access because standardization will be able to, when we have harmonized standards, we'll be able to uh, overcome the trade uh, technical uh, barriers to trade and also ensuring economies of scale in terms of uh, the technologies that are being uh, coming up in Africa. We also facilitate the fitness of purpose for any technology that is pro uh, provided for Africa's use and also encouraging the diffusion and uh, knowledge transfer across African nations in terms of uh, technology advancement. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Peter, pour tous ces éclaircissements. Euh, donc, maintenant, on va passer au prochain panéliste, qui est Monsieur Mohamed Ahmed, donc directeur euh, des énergies renouvelables et de l'efficacité énergétique relevant du ministère de la Transition énergétique et du Développement durable du Royaume du Maroc. Donc, euh, on ne peut pas donc, nier donc, le rôle important que joue ce département de la transition énergétique euh, au niveau national, donc en fournissant le cadre réglementaire nécessaire au développement euh, de l'industrie euh, et du développement euh, de l'efficacité énergétique et de la transition énergétique en général euh, au Maroc, et aussi en euh, mettant en œuvre des stratégies, euh, que ce soit en matière d'efficacité énergétique ou d'énergie renouvelable pour donc renforcer et faciliter notamment les investissements dans ce secteur et aussi mobiliser les organisations et institutions dans la mise en œuvre de ces stratégies. Donc, M. Mohamed Ahmed, donc, il, est à la tête de, il a été la tête de plusieurs responsabilités au sein du ministère de l'énergie, des mines et de l'environnement, principalement en tant que chef de division de la coordination des affaires juridiques, en tant que chargé d'études secrétariat général en tant que chef de la division de la distribution et du marché pétrolier. M. Ahmed est titulaire d'un diplôme d'ingénieur d'État de l'École nationale supérieure des mines de Rabat et du MBA international de Paris, de l'Université Paris. Il va animer aujourd'hui avec nous donc, une présentation sur, euh, pour, qui va porter sur le cadre législatif et réglementaire régissant le secteur des énergies renouvelables dans le Royaume du Maroc. Euh, M. Ahmed euh, je vous souhaite euh, d'abord la bienvenue et vous avez, vous avez 10 minutes pour, fait, pour faire votre présentation. Et merci. Merci beaucoup, M. Hissel. Je ne sais pas si j'ai la main pour euh, partager ma présentation. Donc, euh... Euh, vous pouvez essayer. Sinon, si ça ne marche pas, on peut toujours euh, 
présenter je pense, le. Je pense que c'est faisable, donc je, je... Ouais. Ok. C'est bon. C'est bon, on va, euh, si vous pouvez mettre en plein écran. Plein écran, très bien. C'est bon. C'est bon, parfait. Merci beaucoup. Euh, donc, c'est pour moi un, un énorme plaisir de participer à, cette, à ce webinaire euh, important qui regroupe euh, euh, d'éminents euh, experts marocains, africains, étrangers. Et ça constitue une opportunité euh, pour le Maroc de partager euh, avec ses partenaires euh, le chemin parcouru en termes de transition énergétique, mais également les opportunités offertes et les perspectives euh, de, de, de développement. Je voudrais également remercier et féliciter Larso et Limanor pour l'organisation de, de, de ce panel. Et ma présentation il portera sur quatre axes. Le premier, c'est tout d'abord de... Rappeler les objectifs du modèle de transition énergétique marocain, les avancées réalisées, les perspectives de développement et puis le nouveau cadre réglementaire qui est mis en place pour accélérer les, les, les énergies renouvelables. En termes d'objectifs, donc notre modèle, il a été mis, les fondements de ce modèle de transition énergétique ont été mis en place par Sa Majesté le Roi Codio Lassis depuis 2009 et c'est un modèle qui se base essentiellement sur la montée en puissance des énergies renouvelables, le renforcement de l'efficacité énergétique, mais également le renforcement de l'intégration régionale, notamment à travers le développement des interconnexions avec les pays voisins qui constituent un levier d'accélération des énergies euh, renouvelables. Je voudrais également euh, souligner que le Maroc dispose d'un potentiel important, aussi bien pour l'énergie les, 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 solaire qui, 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 qui dépasse les, les 6,5 kilowattheure par mètre carré par jour, une radiation de 6,5 kilowattheure par mètre carré par jour, mais un potentiel éolien qui est également important et qui est de 25, euh, de 25 gigawatts en euh, on, on, on onshore et qui est euh, qui, qui, qui équivaut à 10 fois le potentiel onshore si on passe, euh, c'est-à-dire au potentiel euh, offshore. En termes de biomasse, l'étude qui a été réalisée également par le, le, le ministère a confirmé qu'il y a un potentiel important en termes de biomasse qui constitue une des sources euh, énergétiques importantes qui, qui est marquée par sa flexibilité mais également par son intensité importante en termes de création d'emplois. Nous avons entamé ces transitions énergétiques par la mise en place d'un cadre institutionnel mais également législatif qui est attractif par la création tout d'abord d'institutions dédiées à la transition énergétique et je citerai en, en, en particulier l'Agence marocaine des énergies durables Mazen, la Société d'investissement énergétique, mais également l'Institut de recherche en énergie solaire et énergie euh, nouvelle. Et à côté, il y avait également le développement d'un écosystème euh, privé euh, qui s'organise aujourd'hui en, en association professionnelle justement pour être un, un acteur clé dans cette transition euh, énergétique. En termes de développement des énergies renouvelables, nous avons trois modèles. Le premier c'est à travers des appels d'offres lancés internationaux qui sont lancés par euh, Mazen et par l'ONE, mais également un autre cadre qui régit le marché libre de l'électricité et qui donne la possibilité à un développeur privé de développer un projet et de commercialiser l'énergie renouvelable produite à travers des consommateurs aussi bien locaux, mais également situés à l'extérieur du royaume à travers de, de, de l'exportation. Et le troisième régime, c'est le régime de, de production qui offre le, le, le droit aux acteurs privés, mais également aux citoyens de développer leur propre euh, euh, centrale de production d'énergie de source euh, renouvelable. Aujourd'hui, le bilan il est encourageant. On a déjà 4,5 gigawatts de renouvelable qui est développé, qui est en exploitation. Et elle représente 40% de notre puissance installée aujourd'hui. Cette capacité développée, elle contribue à satisfaire le 1 cinquième de notre consommation électrique et elle a contribué à réduire notre dépendance énergétique vis-à-vis -vis de l'extérieur, qui était de 97,5% en 2009 et qui est aujourd'hui à, à, réduite à 90%. En termes de perspective, notre programme de développement en notre plan de, de, de développement entre 2023 et 2027, elle prévoit de développer une capacité supplémentaire qui est de l'ordre de 9, 9 300 euh, MW, 
9300 MW qui va nécessiter un investissement de 9 milliards de dollars et euh, dont 7183 MW de sources renouvelables qui nécessitera un investissement de 7 milliards de, de, de dollars dont 3765 MW solaires, 2700 MW éolien et 750 MW euh, hydroélectrique essentiellement sous forme de stations de transfert de l'énergie euh, par, par pompage. Donc, alors, déjà, on souligne que la cadence de développement des énergies renouvelables au Maroc, il sera multiplié au moins par trois à l'horizon 2027. Et ces capacités-là nous rassurent quant à l'atteinte de notre objectif stratégique qui était d'atteindre euh, 52, au moins 52% à l'horizon 2030. Le deuxième levier de notre transition énergétique, c'est bien l'efficacité énergétique où nous avons adopté une nouvelle approche qui vise à ce que, tout d'abord, l'administration donne l'exemple en termes d'efficacité énergétique et d'application des énergies renouvelables, le respect des fondements d'efficacité énergétique par tout nouvel euh, investissement, la structuration et la professionnalisation du secteur de l'efficacité énergétique, mais également le positionnement de l'efficacité énergétique au, au cœur des enjeux et des préoccupations des professionnels et citoyens avec le renforcement des capacités financières et institutionnelles et l'évaluation du programme d'efficacité énergétique. Donc, cette vision a été déclinée en 80 mesures déjà identifiées et leur mise en œuvre permettrait d'atteindre au moins une économie d'énergie à l'horizon 2030 et que, et que touche au secteur du transport, du bâtiment, de l'éclairage public, de l'industrie, mais également de l'agriculture et des pêches euh, maritimes. Aujourd'hui, le gouvernement a donné une nouvelle impulsion pour l'efficacité énergétique à travers, bien sûr, une expérience nouvelle d'incitation à l'efficacité énergétique et qui a euh, incité les citoyens, les consommateurs et les opérateurs économiques à bénéficier d'un bonus en cas d'économie d'énergie. C'était une expérience limitée dans le temps et l'objectif, c'était d'avoir un retour, un retour euh, pour euh, pouvoir euh, à l'avenir, de, 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 c'est-à-dire mettre en place des, des mesures d'incitation c'est-à-dire euh, des mesures d'incitation qui portent sur une durée plus importante. Et le retour qu'on a à travers cette expérience, c'est qu'il y avait une interaction très positive de la part des acteurs euh, économiques, de la part des citoyens, à travers des mesures d'incitation euh, à l'efficacité euh, énergétique. 40% des clients ONE et des clients des distributeurs ont euh, réagi par rapport à cette mesure. Nous avons entamé également la démarche de mise à jour de, notre, de nos programmes sectoriels d'efficacité énergétique et euh, l'élaboration en cours des stratégies euh, régionales d'efficacité énergétique parce que les acteurs locaux euh, s'intéressent encore de plus en plus à des mesures d'efficacité énergétique et à des, pro des programmes d'énergie renouvelable qu'ils intègrent aujourd'hui déjà dans leurs programmes de développement euh, régionaux. Euh, en termes d'amélioration du cadre législatif, les principaux objectifs du nouveau cadre qui vient d'être mis en place, il vise essentiellement à renforcer la transparence et la production des, des, des énergies renouvelables pour avoir une énergie verte et compétitive, simplifier les procédures d'autorisation, le développement de la production décentralisée, la création d'emplois et l'émergence d'un tissu d'entreprises nationales dans le domaine des technologies vertes, l'encouragement de l'investissement privé, mais également le renforcement de la sécurité du réseau euh, électrique. Et la nouvelle réglementation, elle a introduit, compte tenu de la montée en puissance des énergies renouvelables, un certain nombre de concepts pour les réglementer dans le sens de doter, le, 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 c'est-à-dire les opérateurs privés de plus de transparence tout en intégrant les services systèmes. C'est des services qu'il faudrait également prendre en charge par les développeurs privés d'énergie renouvelable, les timbres postes, les timbres moyens tension, la capacité d'accueil, les traitements, l'excédent de production de l'énergie électrique et le stockage de l'énergie électrique. Donc tous ces nouveaux concepts ont été bien sûr réglementés et intégrés dans la nouvelle réglementation. Cette nouvelle réforme a pour objectif également de renforcer la transparence et donner la visibilité et la transparence et qui a été matérialisée par un certain nombre de dispositions qui obligent aujourd'hui le gestionnaire de réseau de distribution et le gestionnaire de réseau électrique et puis l'Autorité nationale, nationale de régulation de l'électricité d'évaluer de, 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 la capacité d'accueil de notre système électrique et de la publier, sur le, le, sur de la publier pour être accessible par les investisseurs privés pour les doter de plus de visibilité en termes d'opportunités d'investissement qu'offre notre système euh, électrique. Les procédures ont été également euh, simplifiées pour respecter les principes de la loi 55-19 relative à la simplification 
de la procédure, mais également, on a inscrit les procédures d'autorisation des énergies renouvelables dans le cadre de l'arrêté relatif aux décisions liées à l'investissement. Et euh, ces démarches-là ont permis de réduire les délais d'autorisation des installations d'énergie de 135 jours à 30 jours, donc c'est-à-dire de 4 mois et demi à 1 mois et demi, avec un allègement de, tout, de tous les délais contraignant les, les, les opérateurs privés, comme l'augmentation de l'utilisation des délais de validité des autorisations de réalisation des, des centrales hydroélectriques de 3 à 5 ans, et puis la possibilité de déposer les dossiers de demande d'autorisation par voie électronique, ce qui donne la possibilité également aux opérateurs, mais également aux Marocains situés à l'étranger, de présenter des dossiers de demande d'autorisation. Le développement de la production décentralisée, c'est un élément qui est très important. On a réussi aujourd'hui à développer des méga-projets à l'instar de la centrale de Ouazazat, mais l'orientation aujourd'hui, c'est également de donner la possibilité aux industriels, aux opérateurs économiques et aux citoyens de développer leur propre centrale d'énergie euh, renouvelable. Et c'est l'objectif d'un certain nombre de dispositifs, de dispositions plutôt, qui ont été intégrés dans le cadre de la nouvelle refonte. C'est la possibilité pour un exploitant d'être approvisionné, d'approvisionner un ou plusieurs consommateurs, la possibilité d'un gestionnaire de réseau de distribution, euh, de distribution de sa, de, d'acquérir 40% d'énergie renouvelable produite au niveau de sa zone de compétence, la possibilité pour un, pour un exploitant de développer une ou plusieurs installations sous le régime de déclaration sans contrainte de capacité, la possibilité pour l'exploitant de réaliser une installation de stockage de l'énergie et de bénéficier de ses services. Et c'est une disposition qui est extrêmement importante parce qu'il offre aux développeurs privés d'avoir des capacités de, de, de stockage, donc plus de flexibilité et plus de, de rentabilité par rapport à, notre projet, à, à leur projet. La possibilité pour l'administration également de recourir à des appels à manifestation d'intérêt pour donner plus de chance aux, aux petites et moyennes entreprises également de contribuer à cette à cette transition énergétique, et le droit de disposer de certificats d'origine. Et ça, c'est une disposition qui est extrêmement importante parce que euh, aujourd'hui euh, les consommateurs donc, ont l'obligation de, d'attester que l'énergie qui a été consommée est bien de source renouvelable. Et nous sommes en train de mettre en place un dispositif qui permette de, de mettre à la disposition des opérateurs de ce certificat d'origine. Donc, le régime de top production, c'est un nouveau régime également qui a été mis en place. Et il permet, euh, il offre, euh, c'est-à-dire, euh, il permet un cadre d'autorisation qui est progressif en fonction de la capacité. On part d'un régime uniquement de, de, de raccordement vers un régime de déclaration pour aller vers un régime d'autorisation en fonction, bien sûr, de la capacité du projet et des contraintes techniques qu'il impose sur le système euh, électrique euh, national. Donc, les projets de crée relatifs à ces, à ces deux lois sont déjà élaborés et ils sont en phase finale de, la, de validation avec les, les, les les partenaires et l'objectif, c'est d'avoir un cadre réglementaire le plus simple possible qui euh, permet aux, aux développeurs, de, de, c'est-à-dire aux opérateurs privés, de concrétiser leur, euh, leur, 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 leur projet. Un autre levier d'accompagnement, c'est la normalisation. Et alors là, on a publié dernièrement une vingtaine de normes marocaines supplémentaires relatives aux produits photovoltaïques et aux installations solaires thermique et je profite de l'occasion pour, pour remercier l'Imanor de son appui et puis un projet de développement de l'infrastructure qualité PV pour renforcer le contrôle de qualité de la certification donc c'est un projet qui permet euh, aux acteurs marocains, aux laboratoires marocains de contrôler, de renforcer leur, leur capacité en termes de contrôle de la qualité des euh, centrales PV et puis les performances minimales des équipements consommateurs d'énergie pour, donc, il y a les arrêtés qui sont déjà établis pour les moteurs, pour les climatiseurs, pour les réfrigérateurs et pour l'éclairage public et d'autres équipements sont programmés à l'avenir. Donc, ce slide-là, ça présente l'impact de cette réglementation sur le nouveau chantier lancé par le Maroc. En termes de décarbonation industrielle, nous avons décidé à ce que toute l'industrie marocaine soit dotée de sources d'énergie renouvelable. Il y a 150 MW déjà qui est autorisé et d'autres projets sont en phase d'étude et l'objectif c'est de doter l'industrie et d'une énergie propre mais également euh, compétitive pour renforcer sa compétitivité en termes d'exportation. Il y a l'hydrogène et le dessalement. L'hydrogène, nous avons fait une étude qui a confirmé que le Maroc dispose d'avantages très importants pour devenir un des acteurs 
clé dans, 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 cette, dans cette filière. Et le travail aujourd'hui, euh, il, 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 aujourd il se penche pour mettre en place une offre marocaine qui permettrait, euh, c'est-à-dire de, de faciliter l'acte d'investir dans, dans, en, en matière d'hydrogène, le dessalement d'eau de mer au, euh, également. Il y a un programme qui est élaboré à l'horizon 2030 et le, le, les instructions royales, c'est de doter ces installations de dessalement de mer par des, des, des centrales, euh, c'est-à-dire renouvelables. La mobilité durable, l'usage euh, domestique et puis l'éclairage public. Et là, je terminerai par le PERM 2.0, c'est très important parce que le Maroc, certes, il a, mis, il a réussi à mettre en place un programme modèle qui est le programme d'électrification rurale globale qui a permis aujourd'hui d'atteindre 99,98% d'accès à l'électricité au niveau national, mais les 0,2% qui restent présentent un défi majeur parce que c'est des villages, c'est des, des, des villages qui sont, qui sont très, très éloignés du réseau ou sont situés dans des zones à accès difficile. Et l'objectif aujourd'hui, c'est d'atteindre 100% par recours aux technologies des énergies renouvelables, mais également en intégrant d'autres dimensions, surtout la dimension d'efficacité énergétique, mais également de développer avec l'accès à l'énergie d'autres activités euh, sociales et économiques qui ont un impact sur, euh, important sur le développement euh, euh, local. Donc, en termes de conclusion, je peux dire que le Maroc a réussi à transformer ces défis énergétiques en opportunités réelles d'investissement. Nous constatons aujourd'hui qu'il y a un intérêt très important vis-à-vis -vis des opportunités qui sont offertes aussi bien par les investisseurs privés, par les bailleurs de fonds, mais également un engagement des acteurs, euh, des acteurs locaux une, de nouvelles réformes pour maintenir cette dynamique de développement, de nouvelles initiatives pour accélérer la transition énergétique au niveau national. Mais il faut souligner qu'il y a de nouveaux défis également qui sont imposés par cette transition énergétique et, et sur lesquels on se penche aujourd'hui, notamment en termes de développement du réseau électrique national, de, développement des moyens de flexibilité, mais également des moyens de stockage pour accompagner la montée en puissance des énergies renouvelables. Et je voudrais terminer par souligner l'importance de la coopération régionale africaine, mais également internationale, pour relever les défis de la transition euh, énergétique qui, le Maroc, bien sûr, reste toujours disposé à, euh, partager, à partager ses expériences et à bénéficier également d'autres euh, expériences euh, pour réussir cette transition énergétique tout en soulignant que la coopération que la coopération africaine constitue un choix stratégique pour le royaume du Maroc et merci pour votre aimable attention. Merci beaucoup monsieur Ahmed pour votre présentation qui était très riche en informations. Donc vous avez souligné bien sûr le potentiel euh, du royaume du Maroc en termes d'énergie renouvelable tout ce en, en spécialement en termes de radiation solaire potentielle et éolien, mais aussi d'autres types d'énergie renouvelable, et aussi les orientations stratégiques et les objectifs qui ont été fixés derrière de 52% euh, du mix énergétique renouvelable et de 20% euh, d'économie d'énergie euh, en 2030, euh, mais aussi donc, le nouveau cadre législatif qui, qui va faciliter euh, les démarches administrative, donc qui va faciliter en plus encore les investissements dans ce secteur euh, et aussi donc le cadre organisationnel, euh, tout ça dans un cadre et des, un contexte international qui est euh, qui connaît plusieurs difficultés et plusieurs enjeux, euh, notamment euh, des enjeux en lien avec la décarbonation. Euh, dans ce sens, je souhaiterais vous poser deux questions. Euh, donc la première, c'est dans le contexte actuel marqué par une mobilisation en faveur de la neutralité carbone, comment le nouveau cadre législatif et réglementaire peut-il répondre aux préoccupations euh, des industriels marocains pour relever ces défis euh, Donc pour la deuxième question, parallèlement à ce cadre législatif et réglementaire, quels sont les autres leviers pour accélérer ces transitions énergétiques Et merci. Donc, merci pour euh, ces deux questions euh, pertinentes. Donc, vous avez soulevé la question de neutralité carbone et la réduction de l'empreinte carbone d'une manière générale. Certes, euh, aujourd'hui, nos partenaires européens imposent des contraintes en termes d'empreinte de, carbone de, 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 des exportations du, du Maroc et d'autres pays africains. Donc, cette contrainte n'a fait qu'accélérer ce processus parce que le Maroc s'est engagé déjà 
pour décarboner son, son, son industrie. Et je pense que, 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 que cette ambition et cet engagement de Maroc a été, euh, a été déjà mis en, en exergue tout à l'heure par le programme de décarbonation industrielle qui est aujourd'hui, euh, c'est-à-dire cadré par une convention euh, qui est signée par toutes les parties prenantes sous la présidence de monsieur le chef du gouvernement et pour laquelle euh, nous avons déjà autorisé euh, des projets d'énergie renouvelable et d'autres sont en phase, en phase, en phase euh, d'étude. Donc, à côté des énergies renouvelables, il y a le levier d'efficacité énergétique qui est également activé. Donc, euh, il y a un cadre réglementaire, il y a des mesures, euh, un cadre incitatif qui est mis en, en place pour permettre aux, aux, aux acteurs, aux opérateurs industriels de, euh, de développer euh, la production euh, propre et réduire leur empreinte carbone. Quant aux autres leviers, donc j'ai cité tout d'abord le levier réglementaire et institutionnel euh, qu'on a essayé d'améliorer de, ma de manière régulière. Donc so, je pense qu'on est en train aujourd'hui de travailler sur la troisième génération du cadre législatif régissant l'investissement privé. Pour les autres leviers, je ne les ai pas abordés parce que j'ai vu au niveau du programme que nos collègues vont intervenir. Tout d'abord, c'est la recherche et développement. La recherche et développement, c'est très important parce qu'on peut importer de la, de la technologie, mais il faudrait qu'il y ait des réadaptations par rapport aux conditions climatiques et conditions, euh, c'est-à-dire euh, locales. Il y a également le volet, le, volet, le volet efficacité énergétique, le volet efficacité énergétique qui est très, très important. Il y a le renforcement de capacité. Nous avons entamé cette transition énergétique par la mise en place d'instituts spécialisés dans le domaine des énergies renouvelables et de l'efficacité énergétique qui forment des techniciens spécialisés, mais également des ingénieurs. Et nous constatons aujourd'hui que presque toutes les universités, toutes les écoles, euh, écoles d'ingénieurs ont mis en place des, des filières, euh, c'est-à-dire orientées vers les technologies vertes, orientées vers l'efficacité énergétique et les énergies euh, renouvelables. Je vous remercie pour votre réponse et vos euh, éclaircissements. Euh, effectivement, donc le, le volet recherche et développement, donc on va en parler euh, très, très tôt. Donc c'est le sujet de notre prochaine présentation euh, qui va être euh, délivrée par Madame euh, Sarah Diori, qui est actuellement directrice des programmes de recherche et développement et d'innovation à l'Institut de recherche en énergie solaire et énergie nouvelle, IRESEN. Au Maroc. Donc, euh, Madame Duré est forte d'une expérience dans le domaine des affaires et de la finance combinée à un fort intérêt pour les objectifs de développement durable des Nations Unies. Elle dirige actuellement les programmes recherche et développement et d'innovation lancés par l'Agence de financement de l'IRESEN pour les projets solaires et d'énergie nouvelle. Donc, elle a aussi donc, est associée à des services de conseil qui ont été fournis à la Banque mondiale à la Banque euh, Recherche et Développement, euh, Banque Européenne de Développement, à l'ONU dit, à GIZ, et ses principaux domaines d'intérêt et d'expertise comprennent le financement du climat et de l'impact, l'entrepreneuriat responsable, l'innovation verte et les programmes de recherche et développement et d'innovation, ainsi que la conception euh, des stratégies. Donc aujourd'hui, elle va nous présenter euh, un thème qui est le rôle de la recherche et développement et de l'innovation dans le secteur des énergies renouvelables pour une Afrique prospère et durable. Euh, donc, Madame Saoudiouri, vous avez dix minutes pour faire votre présentation et merci. Merci beaucoup pour l'introduction. Est-ce que vous m'entendez Oui, on vous entend très bien. Très bien. So, first, I will be presenting in English. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizer uh, in committee for uh, their uh, um, quality of the organization, most specifically Imanor and Arso. Uh, it's really an honor for me to be representing uh, my organization today, uh, IRESEN. And I will try to share a little bit of my knowledge and the, the expertise that IRESEN has developed uh, to give you an idea on the role of R&D and innovation uh, for energy transition in the African context. Uh, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Oui, on le voit. Si vous pouvez voilà, monter l'écran, c'est parfait. Excellent. So, um, as I was saying, IRESEN is a research institute for solar energy and new energies. 
And you may wonder who is behind this organization. So actually we are under the Ministry of Energy Transition and Sustainable Development. And we were created in 2011 in order to support uh, the energy transition strategy that we have in Morocco since 2009. And uh, we have uh, uh, a um, more than 10 board members that are all the key actors in the energy sector in uh, Morocco. So including uh, Amel, ICE, Loni, Managem, Nareva, uh, RD Maroc, Mazen, etc. So all these um, energy stakeholders are part of our board and meet uh, annually uh, to decide on the, the, the strategy of our uh, organization. So IRESEN was created to undergo two main activities. The first one is to develop uh, research and innovation infrastructures. So platforms that are dedicated to developing green technologies. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on during my presentation. Uh, and the other main activity of uh, uh, IRESEN is the funding agency, uh, meaning uh, the, the, the part of the organization that issues calls to fund applied R&D and innovation projects in the sector of, of energy transition. We also have a role uh, where we contribute and support the government in developing technological roadmaps in clean energy sectors, such as solar resources, electric mobility, and more recently, green hydrogen. Uh, our, our goal really at Irizen is to uh, position the Kingdom of Morocco as a continental technological hub uh, in the field of clean uh, energies. And we do so through the infrastructure, through the funding agency, and also through the support to the uh, policy policymakers. So to give you a little bit of an idea of our positioning in the ecosystem, and I figured this would be interesting um, to share with our fellow uh, uh, African countries, uh, is to... Uh, show the, the specific place that Irezen has in the ecosystem. We're in between uh, the private sector and the academic world, uh, because all the research that we support actually are held by consortiums of uh, academics and uh, industrial partners. So uh, this is very important for technology transfer, and especially in the energy sector. And we also have both a national and local approach uh, as I said, we are very close to the Ministry of Energy Transition since they are uh, the president of our board, but we also have the Ministry of Industry and the Ministry of Education that are part of our board. And we are very present locally because all of the projects that we are funding are um, implemented by, uh, by universities all across Morocco. Um, so to, to give you an idea of the topics that we are covering, actually, when we talk about uh, energy transition, uh, this encompasses a various range of topics. Uh, it can include the solar PV or concentrated solar power, but also more recent topics such as uh, green hydrogen, uh, digitalization of energy and smart grids. Uh, we also work a lot on, um, on smart cities and everything related to uh, green buildings and, uh, and the sustainable mobility. And the idea is really to support the technologies that would have the most impact uh, on, the, on the African continent, the most impact in, in Morocco, uh, but also that would have a potential to be exported to the European market. So uh, that's why we have such a big range of uh, topics that we are covering. Um, we are also trying to be very active uh, at the, the international level, because since climate change is a global issue, um, the, we believe that uh, it needs a global solution. Uh, that's why we are very uh, active in international uh, platforms, such as the one we are active in uh, today. And I'm very excited to see that there's over 120 uh, participants today. Um, we really are willing to uh, open up and to be part of uh, uh, the clean energy discussions happening around the world. So uh, this is uh, done under the form of a uh, uh, solar Paces, for example, we're part of Solar Paces, which is a, an initiative by the International Energy Agency. We're part of Mission Innovation, uh, which is a coalition of uh, over 20 countries to accelerate innovation in the field of green energy. And we are also the founders and initiators of the Green Africa Innovation Network. And this may be of interest uh, for, for our conversation today. Uh, the idea is to connect uh, and to um, support exchanges between African partners in the field of innovation in, in uh, uh, green technologies. 
So for now, we have uh, uh, more than 10 countries that are represented in this network, but we are really open to uh, broadening this network and uh, welcoming as many uh, African partners as possible to grow um, the, 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 the network and deepen the discussions. Uh, and the, today's opportunities actually shows how uh, and the diversity in, of, uh, of uh, regions represented today show that uh, there is really a, a need and, a, and a, a, an opportunity for a green energy transition in uh, the African context. So uh, to give you more details about the infrastructure that we have developed, here you have the map of Morocco with the, the, the platforms that have been developed already. And if you haven't had the chance, uh, I would really encourage you, uh, whenever you are in Morocco, to come uh, visit us and come visit uh, those platforms. Uh, the first one that we launched is the Green Energy Park. It was initiated, uh, inaugurated in 2017, and it is uh, uh, dedicated to solar technologies because we believe that in the Moroccan and African context, uh, there is a, a need for uh, local technologies in this in this field. Uh, more recently, we inaugurated the Green and Smart Building Park. It was uh, inaugurated earlier this year, and it is dedicated to green buildings, smart grids, and sustainable mobility. We are working on a green hydrogen platform to, towards uh, the area of Morocco called the Jorf Lasfar. It will be uh, dedicated to the production of green molecules. And we are undergoing a project in uh, Côte d'Ivoire, in Ivory Coast, called uh, uh, Green Energy Park Morocco Côte d'Ivoire. It's done in partnership with the University um, Oufouet Boueni in Yamoussoukro in, in, in Côte d'Ivoire. And it's a, it's a platform that is focusing on solar energy in tropical environments. Uh, if you don't have a chance to come visit us, here are some uh, drone photos of the platform. So you can see uh, that the research and innovation that we are supporting is done in a, what we call living labs or open air labs. Um, there's also some, uh, some uh, more traditional labs, but the idea is to have a, a scale of research that is uh, um, uh, interesting for potential industry players to implement those technologies in their processes or in, in their businesses. So that, that's the idea. Each platform has a technological roadmap. I'm not gonna get into the details of each one, but just for you to know that uh, there is, a, there is a, a lot of uh, uh, detailed um, roadmaps for each, uh, for each uh, platform. Um, this is the Green and Smart Building part that I was mentioning just now. Uh, it's the one dedicated to uh, sustainable, um, uh, mobi uh, sustainable mobility, uh, energy efficient buildings. Uh, and again, it's an open air uh, labs. So for example, the houses that you see at the back, uh, they were uh, built with innovative technologies such as 3D printing, such as uh, um, efficient construction materials. So the idea is really to, to test and demonstrate those technologies at an at a interesting scale for possible market applications. Um, again, the Green and Smart Building Park has its own technological uh, roadmap uh, around the, the areas that are, are in the scope. And that's the last platform that I was mentioning, the one in uh, Ivory Coast. Uh, this is not a picture, it's a 3D model, but uh, we have been uh, making improvements and installing some demonstrators and we're hoping to inaugurate the platform uh, at some point in 2024. So uh, this was one area of, uh, of our work. This is the R&D platforms. Uh, but then we also, um, in order to support energy transition and projects, we are also supporting, uh, we are also developing a funding agency activities. So actually my, my role at IRESEN is uh, the director of uh, R&D programs of the funding agency. Um, so how does it work? Uh, sorry, uh, it, it is actually um, a platform, not a platform, but a program that provides financing, scientific and technical expertise, access to the infrastructure, technological support, and also support in business development. So if you come with a project, um, innovative project, so say you wanna develop a new type of storage or new type of, uh, of a um, uh, smart grid or uh, optimize a cleaning solution for solar panels, uh, you, you, you need to combine as a consortium, uh, as I was saying, industry player and academic player. Um, and you, you can apply to our funding and uh, based on the selection committee, 
and the scientific committee, you can benefit from uh, not only the funding, but mostly the expertise, which is uh, sometimes more difficult to access than the funding. So far, we have been able to, to fund uh, over 70 projects, uh, and they have had great scientific outputs, um, more than 300 publications, more than 400 communication and tenders. And uh, we, we are also mostly uh, proud of all the, the doctors or all the PhD students that uh, uh, that have been uh, uh, graduating through uh, the projects that we funded. Um, to, to give you a little bit of an idea on uh, the, the calls that we have launched, some are national scale, the Green Inno Project and Green Inno Boost, but we also support bilateral partnerships and multilateral partnerships. So the one I wanted to focus on for this presentation is LEAPRE, uh, is the long-term European African partnership in renewable energies. Uh, it actually involves 16 funding agencies from around the, uh, Europe and Africa. And the idea is to fund uh, projects that, that are undertaken by four countries, two European countries and two African countries. And this has been a very good opportunity for us to partner with the fellow African countries and fund the projects that are at a larger, larger scale. Um, in terms of uh, examples, just to give you some examples of the innovative project that we've uh, been able to fund, and that also resonates with the presentation that my colleague Mr. Ahmed did uh, a couple of minutes ago, uh, we are focusing on projects that have, uh, um, they are aligned with the, our national energy strategy and that have a big impact. So for example, here you can see the solar fridge. Uh, we supported the consortium to design and manufacture a solar fridge on a scooter with insulation made from palm wood. So the idea is to um, enable uh, small agriculture or small um, uh, small merchant, um, people carrying uh, like uh, vegetables or fish in the market to store uh, their their goods uh, in a in a in a solar fridge, so using solar energy to keep uh, the the vehicle cool. Uh, we're also working on batteries that are made 100% with the local minerals, so uh, based in uh, minerals in Morocco. Um, and we also work on industry related pro projects such, such as this one. Um, it's a bitumen heating solution. Um, uh, the idea is to keep the bitumen storage hot using high energy solar panels. So we have, as I said, more than 80 projects, so I cannot go through all of them, but uh, that gives you an idea and maybe we can go uh, in the details later. Um, one of the key challenges of uh, energy transition uh, and actually in the field of uh, R&D and innovation is how do we uh, transform the R&D uh, projects or the applied R&D projects into marketable products or, or, or services. So that's what we call technology transfer to the market or valorization. Uh, we have been able, successful with some projects to, to go all the way to the, to the um, next stages of, uh, of uh, uh, technology development. So for example, the charging station eSmart, that is a charging sta station developed 100% in Morocco. Uh, this one is a really, um, there is a production uh, line in uh, in the green energy park and we're able to get out of the lab and really go to, to market scale. Um, but, but so yeah, that's what I was mentioning, the, the production line that you can see, but the challenges are, are really uh, big in terms of uh, ensuring technology transfer, especially in the African context. Um, I would like to mention some of the new platforms just because the, the topic of green hydrogen is so important. So uh, we, we believe that uh, the future of, especially in the context of Morocco, we have a big potential for green hydrogen. Uh, and the, the idea is to develop a R&D platform that would be dedicated solely to those topics. It is under construction. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it really uh, will, would build on all the value chain from generation to conversion to your usage of the, the green molecule. So uh, it's a new value chain, it has a new potential, and uh, we are willing also to partner with fellow African countries to develop furthermore this this uh, station, this uh, platform. Ma, ma, uh, Madame Diori, si vous pouvez juste uh, have une minute ou deux minutes pour conclure, parce qu'on est un peu, okay. le programme est chargé. Well, I, I was getting to the end of my presentation. Um, yeah, maybe the, the last uh, 
The last slide I wanted to share is on the uh, green hydrogen cluster. Uh, Irizan was able to create this cluster to uh, create synergies in the green hydrogen value chain. And of course, I'm happy to use some more time during the uh, Q&A uh, to provide any additional information. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup pour votre présentation. Donc, euh, c'est vrai que le, le temps donc, et le, la programmation n'a pas permis donc, euh, que vous ayez le, le temps de, de dérouler toute votre présentation. Néanmoins, donc, on, a, on a pu avoir une idée, donc, sur, euh, on a saisi l'importance du, du rôle euh, que peut jouer la recherche et le développement et l'innovation dans le développement euh, du secteur de la transition énergétique, euh, des énergies renouvelables et surtout des technologies de pointe. Et je suis aussi ravi d'entendre de, que euh, ces projets sont souvent portés par euh, le niveau académique, c'est-à-dire les universités, euh, et notamment au niveau des, des projets de PhD, doctorat, euh, et l'utilisation de, de technologies de pointe comme euh, euh, les technologies des batteries, la, la, la pression 3D et autres. Euh, et, et ces technologies sont testées au niveau des, des parcs euh, Green Energy Park, comme vous l'avez décrit, on l'a pu le voir durant votre présentation. Donc, je souhaiterais euh, vous poser deux questions par rapport aux au défis au défi du transfert des technologies vers le, marché, vers le marché dans le contexte africain. Et aussi, quels sont les éléments des approches innovantes dans le domaine des énergies renouvelables et comment la recherche et développement sont-ils essentiels à leur développement Merci. Uh, I can keep going in English. I think we have mostly English speakers, correct? So uh, thank you for those questions. Uh, as I was highlighting, uh, technology transfer is really a challenge because if we're talking about energy transition, Uh, it is important to develop new storage solutions, new um, energy, like smart grid solutions, new um, green molecules, and so on and so forth. But there's always the economic factor. So the idea of uh, uh, having those technologies reach the market and being actually used, uh, because if they're not actually used, then we're not de decarbonizing our industry. We are not actually having the, the environmental impact that we want to have. So. I, as I always say, R&D and innovation, if it stays in the lab, it will not um, contribute to the decarbonation of our, of our industries. And uh, therefore, the, the, this stage of technology transfer is, is very, very critical. And sometimes we call it the death valley because that's where a lot of projects realize, oh, the technology is great, but the cost, it's not affordable. It's not affordable for a business to use maybe this source of energy or these amount of solar panels, so on and so forth. So uh, it's really important to um, uh, pursue a research that is addressing market needs, ad addressing the, the need of the industry and going through all the stages so that those technologies are actually used in the market. Some of the challenges uh, are around the, the regulatory framework because um, at, at least in the Moroccan context, sometimes the researchers Uh, are not allowed legally to uh, create a company or they're not allowed to become an entrepreneur and things like that. So they would have to quit their job as a professor. And then, so the alternative is to, to sell the technology, but then uh, who, th there is no clear valorization path yet. Uh, there's no clear technology transfer um, approach yet. And uh, th that's why it's very important to, uh, to um, raise awareness amongst uh, researchers and amongst innovators uh, to develop solutions that will go all the way to the market. And maybe if it means selling your solution at some point and you become the CTO, like the chief technology officer, and you hire a CEO to, to develop the business side of the, the, your, your, your technology, it's very important. Uh, and then the, the, the other question, if you can remind me, donc, c'était les, les approches innovantes dans le domaine des énergies renouvelables et, et comment la recherche et le développement sont-ils essentiels à leur développement. Brièvement, si okay. vous, vous souhaitez. OK, very, very quickly. I'm just going to give the... I think for me, one of the best examples is the storage uh, because um, renewable energy, by definition, are intermittent. So uh, you need storage solutions to, to, to be able to to rely, to have a reliable source of energy. And uh, the R&D uh, is coming up with a lot of innovative uh, 
uh, storage solutions that are more or, or less economic, uh, eco um, economically viable. And that's for me one of the best ex examples. Smart grids are also a very good ex example in the African context. Uh, because some areas that are not connected to the the, the grid uh, use off-grid solutions. I meant off-grid, sorry. And those off-grid solutions are are able to provide uh, the 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 communities with electricity uh, thanks to those innovations. Very briefly. Merci beaucoup votre pour votre intervention. C'est je comprends c'est difficile de. Euh, de répondre à ce genre de... On aura besoin de, de, de plus de temps, mais euh, malheureusement, on est euh, limité par le, le temps et le programme. Euh, donc, euh, on va passer la, la euh, le, le quatrième panéliste. Pardon. Donc, on a parlé du cadre réglementaire, euh, de la transition énergétique, de l'importance de la recherche et du développement. Maintenant, on va euh, mettre le point... Et mettre la lumière aussi sur euh, l'importance de l'efficacité énergétique et avec nous pour le présenter M. Mohamed Lehouari qui est directeur du cluster énergie renouvelable efficacité énergétique à l'agence marocaine pour l'efficacité énergétique AMI donc euh, M. Houari a d'abord travaillé comme ingénieur de développement dans un bureau d'études et d'ingénierie avant de rejoindre euh, l'AMI pour occuper plusieurs postes de responsabilité euh, Monsieur Houari est membre aussi d'un réseau d'experts ex, et, et une expérience confirmée dans le secteur des énergies renouvelables et de l'efficacité énergétique chargé de mettre en œuvre plusieurs programmes avec euh, des instances internationales comme le programme national des, des Nations Unies pour le développement, la Banque africaine de développement, etc. Monsieur Houari va euh, nous présenter aujourd'hui euh, le thème de la stratégie de l'AMI en relation avec le développement de l'efficacité énergétique au, au Maroc. Euh, Monsieur Houari, vous avez donc 10 minutes pour présenter et c'est, euh, s'il vous plaît, de rester sur euh, le, le temps alloué. Vous avez la parole. Merci. Euh, merci beaucoup. Euh, je crois que je vais poursuivre un petit peu. Je vais essayer de parler sur en anglais. Euh, je vais essayer de partager. De... I will... First, I would like to, to thank uh, the organizers for... Uh, give us the opportunity, our agency, to present, uh, let's say, the energy efficiency plans, but also programs, but also the role of renewable energy in this uh, uh, programs, energy efficiency programs. I will, let's say, share the presentation. So, I don't know. Come on. C'est le bouton vert en, en bas. Partager l'écran. Ah oui, 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 oui. Alors, OK. Voilà. Voilà. Est-ce que vous voyez? Si vous pouvez mettre en plein écran. C'est bon? C'est parfait. So, I would like to present, I would like to thank the, the organizer. So, I will present the main energy efficiency program in, in our country uh, and the role of renewable energy uh, through the, the integration of energy, through the energy efficiency programs and technologies. Uh, so my, my agency, uh, the Moroccan agency is uh, of uh, energy efficiency, is in charge to implement uh, energy efficiency programs in uh, the, the country, in Morocco, in the five main sectors, in uh, uh, transport, in uh, building, in the uh, industry, in uh, lighting, public lighting, and in agriculture. So for, for this, uh, to achieve this purpose, we have in our country a new law on energy efficiency, which uh, is uh, published in uh, 2011, and it's laid down the basic foundation to promote energy efficiency at national level, including uh, optimal management of energy resources, controlling energy demand. So we, we act on the, the two sides, on, in, on the demand and the, uh, the, uh, the offer of uh, energy. So uh, we have set up this uh, strategy by, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, to search. We have four main uh, objectives and goals to achieve by 2030, uh, mainly in the transport sector, in the industrial sector, in the building, and in public lighting. We have done a huge study in uh, 2012, and we have uh, 
let's say 100 or 80 measures uh, to implement to achieve these goals. So all these programs include they include the the, the decentralized technologies, renewable energy decentralized technology like uh, solar roof uh, pumping and uh, other uh, technologies, renewable energy technologies. So what we have uh, belongs to to this uh, law. To this uh, we have a three main decree for the application of this law. The first one is let's say in. Uh, uh, in uh, um, complying to some uh, standards. It's minimum energy performance of appliance and equipment. Um, and it is uh, it's a, a link between the, 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 the law and application of the law. This is the decree with, that we have uh, with the ministries, our ministries have uh, released. So uh, the first one is uh, uh, concerning the minimum energy performance of appliance and equipment for um, four main equipment. It's for uh, electrical motors, transformers, air conditioners, and the refrigerators. The second decree is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, has the goal uh, to uh, approve the general building regulation, thermal regulation. So we have in Morocco in 2014 or 2015, we have a new uh, regulatory framework to uh, implement uh, thermal, uh, let's say, insulation in the building and uh, thermal regulation in new buildings. So all the new buildings should have this uh, requirement to comply with this uh, decree. So uh, in the building sector, we have also developed uh, energy performance for some uh, equipment, uh, for glazing, for orientation, solar protection, and windows and so on. We have also an, another decree, it's for the audits. So in the private sectors and uh, industries, all the industries that are consuming more than 1,500 1, uh, oil ton equivalent per year should uh, make uh, energy audits of the company of the industry. For the tertiary sector, the same thing. You have to do or to uh, implement uh, an audit, energy audit, in order to uh, identify what are the main uh, measures, action, projects to reduce your energy bills or energy, uh, yes, energy bills. So the main, uh, our, our army programs in the five sector, let's say for the building, we have national program for energy efficiency uh, in building light, public. We have also developed a national software, Binayat, which is called Binayat, for to check if the uh, new building is complying with the uh, new thermal uh, regulation. We have also developed a new label, uh, uh, label for green mosque. It's given to the mosques that are complying with the, the, the best practice in uh, uh, energy, uh, water, and environmental uh, issues. We have also developed this uh, regulatory framework, which are the RCCM, uh, in order to, uh, let's say, um, it's uh, it's mandatory uh, and uh, all new uh, buildings should comply with this uh, regulation. We have also developed some uh, fuel uh, wood efficiency heating and cooking system in rural and mountain areas. The goal is that, uh, or the purpose of this, uh, this technology is to improve or to help improve uh, the, the citizen uh, living in the rural areas and the mountains areas to use or to, uh, to purchase uh, high efficiency uh, cooking and heating uh, systems. We have also developed technical assistance for private sectors. We have developed some level building on uh, energy leveling standards for electrical projects and appliance, uh, mainly in refrigerators and air conditioning. In the industrial sector, we have developed decarbonization uh, with uh, energy audits, uh, use of runway energy, uh, supplying uh, energy supply, and so on. We are also working with green industrial zones to, uh, to help them uh, improving uh, or implementing energy audits. Uh, we have also, uh, we contribute to the national program, which is called Tatwil Green, uh, uh, funds or uh, green project, which aims to uh, help the, uh, let's say, uh, green growth program help to uh, the, the industries to 
uh, achieve or to implement energy efficiency or rural energy measures in the industries. So it is subsidized on uh, uh, programs, but also on studies. We also uh, have energy or this program for small and medium uh, energy uh, companies. And we also develop some financial measures and incentives through local banks. So we have a national local bank that offers uh, some help or uh, credits or incentives for uh, renewable energy or energy efficiency uh, programs. In the agriculture sectors, we also work for developing solar pumping uh, systems, uh, energy audits in large farms, and uh, minimum energy performance standards for electric and components. In uh, transport sectors, we work to develop, let's say, uh, the Oro 6 in, in our country, in the transport, develop energy measures uh, in management of public vehicle fleets. We develop also a national uh, label or sticker promoting uh, electrical vehicle charging station and proposal for energy consumption standards uh, for motorcycle and three-wheelers. We also, in parallel, uh, develop awareness campaign and training. We have a green platform in Marrakech, uh, which, is, uh, which gives uh, training and uh, awareness for the public or for private sectors. We develop a label uh, which is called Taka Pro uh, PV Plus. It's a label that's given for any companies that are that are sell the PV roofs or PV systems. So uh, we give these labels for them and for the installers uh, if they are complying of the uh, the best practice and the standards in uh, PV uh, implementing uh, systems. We have also run a lot of energy efficiency campaigns, uh, campaigns uh, for awareness and uh, published a number of guides uh, and energy efficiency is in our site's uh, website, so you can uh, download it. Okay, I think it's okay. Thank you. Merci, M. le Houari. Donc, euh, votre présentation a été riche euh, également en informations. Donc, vous avez bien souligné donc, le, le, le cadre euh, et le contexte, ainsi que la stratégie euh, du Royaume du Maroc en termes d'efficacité énergétique, ainsi que les cibles et les objectifs sectoriels, donc notamment les secteurs du transport, l'industrie, la construction, l'agriculture, l'éclairage public, et aussi le, le rôle de, du cadre réglementaire donc, notamment par rapport à l'échiquetage énergétique. Euh, et je tiens à ajouter aussi le, le rôle des normes, euh, des normes marocaines euh, dans le, la mise en œuvre de ces réglementations. Comme vous le savez, donc, il existe des normes d'échiquetage énergétique euh, qui va fixer les exigences pour les appareils électroménagers. Même chose pour tout ce qui est euh, construction thermique durable, toutes les normes qui donnent présomption de conformité. Euh, donc, euh, par rapport à des aspects comme l'isolation thermique, l'étanchéité euh, et autres, euh, également le rôle du management de l'énergie et par rapport à l'audit énergétique obligatoire. Euh, vous avez aussi présenté donc, les, les différents programmes et labels qui vont promouvoir l'efficacité énergétique, que ce soit au niveau de l'industrie, de l'agriculture, du transport et, et d'autres euh, secteurs. Donc, euh, dans ce contexte, je vais vous poser quelques questions par rapport aux, aux éléments clés de l'industrialisation verte ainsi que les stratégies clés mises en place par le Royaume du Maroc pour faciliter cette industrialisation durable. Et merci. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, for the green, let's say, industry, there are a lot of, um, of uh, incentives. Uh, mainly the, the program, um, I mean, there are a lot of uh, programs uh, for all uh, kinds of industries. But for green project, we have this kind of project, which is Maroc Tetwer Ver, um, offered by Maroc PME, which is a, a, a national uh, institute or not not institute, not national agency or a, a, a national entities. Let's say a public entities which give which give. Uh, uh, which help uh, the companies or the industries to implement a uh, uh, green project, let's say. So they give uh, subsidized uh, up to 30% for projects and uh, for green project 
and 90% uh, for uh, studies. So this is the main, uh, let's say, uh, level uh, of uh, helping the industry in Morocco. There are a lot of uh, in training, in, uh, in uh, awareness, public awareness, and uh, private uh, with, with private companies. So there are there are a lot of incentives, but the main one in green technology is, is this one. And uh, we work uh, with them to help uh, develop uh, the, the, the circular economy uh, for all kinds of, of, of industries, mainly the industry of agro uh, and also uh, the industry of uh, chemical and parachemical sector. Merci encore pour votre intervention et vos éclaircissements. Euh, donc, euh, on va continuer notre programme euh, avec notre cinquième panéliste qui nous vient de l'Arabie Saoudite. Donc, M. Euh, Mohamed Attayar, donc, qui est actuellement directeur du programme de durabilité du pétrole. Donc, un programme conçu pour créer des applications nouvelles et innovantes pour les hydrocarbures qui sont à la fois avantageuses sur le plan environnemental et économique. Donc, il est membre de plusieurs comités de l'écosystème du ministère de l'énergie et se concentré sur les objectifs de mise en œuvre du programme. Avec de multitudes de rôles techniques et de direction, Mohamed Attayar a plus de 20 ans d'expérience dans le domaine de l'énergie. Donc, il va nous présenter aujourd'hui euh, une présentation autour du thème euh, « L'accélération » de l'accès universel de l'Afrique à des solutions énergétiques renouvelables propres et abordables en Afrique, l'initiative régionale du Moyen-Orient sur les solutions de combustibles propres pour la cuisson et les potentiels pour l'Afrique grâce à la coopération en matière de normes et d'évaluation de la conformité. Monsieur Mohamed Tayar, donc vous avez euh, 10 minutes pour présenter votre euh, présentation et merci. Thank you very much. Uh... Bonjour, comment ça va? Je m'appelle Mohamed. That's the French <laughs> interview today. Um, it's a pleasure being with you. Um, and also, it's also very difficult for me to uh, speak towards the end, uh, since all of my great uh, panelists before me have really showcased some, some wonderful insights. So I'm going to try to add to what my colleagues have, uh, have done as well. I have prepared for you a few slides Uh, that will hopefully um, uh, create some, some additional interest and excitement in some of the areas that we're working on within the program. Uh, so if you allow me, I'll just walk you through it uh, very quickly. Uh, and if you have any questions, of course, uh, we are available to uh, discuss and, and showcase. Um, if you just, uh, uh, let me just make sure that uh, my, you can see my slides. If you can just right click and uh, hide presentation mode. Right click in the image and then hide presentation mode. Please activate your mic. We can't. We cannot hear you. Can you see the slides now? Yes, you can. You can. Okay. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Okay. So, um, as as uh, first of all, you know, it's it's very important to set uh, the the right context of why we're doing this um, effort and what is the potential on creating solutions uh, that will really help address a pain point for a big majority of people globally. Um, so there is a challenge. Uh, this is a global challenge. And the challenge, um, you know, I, I would love to share with you some key insights. Um, the majority of the world is, um, has, has a, a blind spot towards this challenge related to uh, the space of clean cooking. A big portion of the world, more than 2 billion people in the world don't have access to clean cooking solutions. And I think this is something that we really realized uh, is very fundamental uh, to human existence. Um, this is just a listing of statistics related to 
where is the majority of this challenge? Um, and although that there are improvements that are happening today in the African continent, we have realized that it's not as um, advanced and it's not advancing as fast as we would like it. In fact, in some areas we are seeing regression. So this idea of availing access to cleaner cooking solutions really sparked our um, our mindset uh, within the kingdom that how can we create this positive impact? And I'll, I'll give you a little bit more context on how we're approaching this very important challenge. We know that um, if you do use conventional cleaning, uh, sorry, cooking methods, um, you, you face a challenge. Um, one big challenge is public health. So if I'm burning wood, burning coal um, in a household and I'm cooking two to three times a day, just imagine what type of fumes that are coming uh, from those types of methods. And the reality is there are close to 4 million people in the world dying prematurely because of this um, ineffective way of cooking. So uh, it's a public health issue. It's a, it's a public health issue where we need to, as a, you know, a global uh, population, really re-emphasize and focus on. The second um, impact area is the environment. So if we consider close to 60% of carbon black emissions coming from burning these solid, of these solid fuels, why? Because you have to go and cut trees or burn trees um, and when you do this, you're actually generating a bigger uh, carbon footprint. Um, so the idea is, can we create a substitute to cutting the trees and producing the charcoal while you're burning them? That is actually more cleaner. And that's something that we have to um, consider in terms of our environmental um, implications. Thirdly, and you know, this term is, I call it women empowerment, but if we envision how much time is spent on average on a weekly basis to go and procure uh, these materials, whether it's wood or biomass. On average, 10 to 12 hours a week are spent by the women in these households to procure the wood. So the challenge for us is actually an opportunity. What if we're able to reorient the hours spent outside the homes? And in some cases, women and children are procuring this um, wood and give those hours back to the households. What if we're able to allow the women, the children, the family members to spend these hours in something that will add more value to their lives? For example, they can spend it on self-development, learning a new trait, starting you know, a small business, um, taking care of themselves um, and creating activities that will generate more economic value for the household. This is a new view for us. And because the biggest uh, portion of impact is happening to women who are in these households, we think this, is, this will be a great opportunity to uplift those um, uh, individual uh, people into a better uh, situation where, where we can create a lot of value for them. Uh, and finally, household economics. So if you envision more than 2 billion people in the world that are relying on these solid fuels for their cooking solutions, um, and a third or 33% of their income is being spent on procuring um, you know, this wood or, or biomass or coal. What if you create better economics for them? What if you create a, a cleaner and more cost-effective uh, solution? Bringing that money back to the household is something that we're really keen on, on evaluating and exploring. Now, why is the kingdom doing this? When we did the G20 hosting back uh, a, few, a few years ago, there was an ambition that was announced. The kingdom endorsed uh, this idea with its G20 partners of availing energy access and clean cooking solutions to um, a big portion of the world. Um, when this G20 announcement happened, it was followed by something that's called the launching of the Saudi Green Initiative and the Middle East Green Initiative. And when we launched this, global initiative under that umbrella. And that's why you see the logo of, uh, we, you know, the short term is MGI, uh, which is short for the Middle East Green Initiative. We had a very ambitious target. The target for us is 750 million people 
globally. Uh, the majority of them are in the African continent. And the idea is how can we avail cleaner cooking solutions to help reduce the carbon footprint, improve the quality of life, um, create economic growth uh, for them, and also as a global community, mitigate the climate challenge from happening that happens from removing these carbon sinks when you're cutting the trees and burning coal um, or wood or even biomass. So it's a really an ambition that the kingdom thinks about from a leadership point of view, but we also need to aggregate different entities, companies, think tanks, organizations, countries, funding agencies to come and work with us to address this very ambitious um, approach. This is not just something that Saudi Arabia needs to focus on. This is something that the entire global community needs to focus on. I really wanna emphasize that. Now, when we launched this effort, we really wanted to approach it in a very holistic way. So you will see seven pillars that we focused on across four themes. Um, the first one for us is advocacy. So you need to advocate and create the right awareness for sustainable energy or renewable energy to be deployed as an alternative to existing and traditional cooking solutions. So one thing we've been working on is on promotion of behavioral changes, um, where you create structural training programs to introduce these new cooking solutions. I'll give you an example. In, in some of the countries, I won't name the countries, but in some of the countries that we've been working on um, and trying to, to promote some of these solutions, some of the findings that we found is people feel that cooking with traditional cooking methods like wood or coal uh, or even biomass, the food tastes better than cooking using, for example, solar cooking stove or um, uh, uh, gas, gas stove. And, and you know that really needs to... Um, we need to really focus on shifting the behavior of the consumers and making sure that they all have the right awareness around what types of solutions are there and what and how does this affect the quality of the food that they've been prepared. So this is a, a constant reinforcement message. Um, the second area we're really focusing on is availing increased access. So how do we look at the uh, providing new means for these solutions, whether it's a renewable power, um, cooking solution like biodigesters or, or solar energy or uh, gas cooking stoves. And for example, going to a rural area where access is not there and trying to avail um, the innovative approach where you can make it available. For example, solar works better in rural areas. Um, gas stoves will work better in urban areas. And you really need to play into the strengths of each setup. Um, Thirdly, it's really where we're focusing on our efforts on the uh, existing efforts with, with ARSO and others, um, where we're trying to, to create a sustainable market uh, for growing clean cooking solutions. So if you wanna create increased adoption, there has to be the right regulatory landscape um, and the right regulatory environment where these uh, solutions can be increased in their adoption. And that's really part of our harmonization project that was mentioned earlier by um, our friends in ARSO. That's what we're trying to do, create a standard where volume of countries adopt uniformly uh, these solutions that will create tremendous impact, positive impact, if I may add. And finally, how do you remove the barriers for energy access in these markets that probably don't have the access? So we as a kingdom have an obligation given our hydrocarbon endowment and given our strength and capabilities in the energy space to be a secure, reliable, provider of energy to the world. And, and this is something that we believe uh, strongly and we believe that we will work with every stakeholder we can to achieve that. Now, I mentioned the solutions. I won't uh, go into a lot of details, but this, these are the three main uh, solutions that we we're working on. The first one is LPG, which is the traditional gas cylinders. The second is biogas. And the third is solar energy. And we really are mapping out where these solutions can be uh, leverage depending on the country's um, infrastructure, uh, supply chain um, uh, capabilities, needs. Some countries will have all of the solutions. Some countries will have one. Uh, we're really being very dynamic in how we're approaching this and we're leveraging all of our resources in the kingdom and our partners outside the kingdom to try and, and make, uh, make these solutions more prevalent than the conventional uh, traditional methods that we've talked about. 
And now I just want to highlight some of uh, the things that I mentioned earlier, specifically on the standards and the technical regulations that need to come in play. We have a harmonization um, project with ARSO uh, for specifically on African standards for clean fuel solutions for cooking. This focuses both on the, the products and the processes. And, and you know, we coined this term specifically to make sure that we are approaching it from a very holistic point of view. This collaboration, I may add, has been very rich, has been very ongoing. It really shows how two like-minded organizations can come together with uh, one really specific and important humanitarian goal. And I think if we really think creatively um, and think in, in terms of what are the available solutions that are out there that we can leverage together, I think we can create huge impact um, specifically if we're able to create these new adoptions um, from these standards that will be harmonized with our partners in ARSA. Now, uh, I just want to highlight one last... Uh, sorry, angle. sorry, yes. mis sorry, Mr. Mohammed. Just uh, if you can wrap up in the next two minutes. Yes, this is my last uh, slide. We still have... Uh... Okay, yes, thank yes. you. This is my last slide, thank you. So, um, once we came out with the solution that we're gonna go with a solar um, application. Solar creates electricity in areas where there is no electricity. We are working now with our partners um, to see if we can approach this in a very holistic manner. So we're focusing on energy, connectivity, education and e-health. And I think once you think about how many UN sustainable development goals you can achieve, this can be this can go even beyond clean cooking. And I'll leave it at that and maybe allow for any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mohammed. Uh, I will uh, uh, continue in French if you don't mind activating the interpretation. Uh, donc, uh, merci pour votre riche présentation uh, en information. Donc, vous avez montré donc l'impact des activités humaines sur uh, l'environnement, uh, la santé publique et autres uh, dans le, le contexte de uh, la cuisson. Donc, et l'importance d'utiliser des solutions durables pour la cuisson et qui sont éco aussi économiquement viables. Euh, tout ça dans le but, bien sûr, de, de l'amélioration de la qualité de vie, euh, mais aussi de réduire l'empreinte carbone. Euh, donc, euh, il est très important, bien sûr, on a bien saisi l'importance euh, euh, à partir de votre présentation d'encourager et de sensibiliser encore sur l'utilisation des énergies renouvelables, notamment l'énergie solaire, pour euh, les, les procédés euh, de cuisson. Euh, je voudrais vous poser deux questions, et dans le contexte, vraiment dans le contexte africain, notamment par rapport à l'accès à l'énergie, euh, comment assurez-vous le succès du programme Initiative Empowering Africa, mais aussi quels sont les rôles des normes pour la mise en œuvre de l'initiative des solutions de combustibles propres pour la cuisson Et merci. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this question. I think it's um, for us, we have decided in the kingdom that this is a holistic challenge. So you need to bring multiple entities to come with you to help you achieve this challenge. So in the kingdom, we've started this. And I mentioned this uh, concept of empowering Africa. We launched this effort back in MENA Climate Week. So with us today, is the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And with us today as well is the Ministry of Health within the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And why? Because we are now introducing e-health or telehealth and e-education. So this is um, a new unlock that we've created. So now you have an opportunity to, cl to create clean cooking solutions. You introduce connectivity. Connectivity allows for education online services to be introduced to parts of the country, whatever country the project will be, and also allowing for um, health services to be introduced as well. This is a very powerful approach. And if we do this successfully in one country, imagine the impact or the positive impact that you can do in multiple other countries. Again, this is now uh, something that the kingdom is really putting a lot of resources and efforts and we, and I, I mentioned it to, to all of you, are really seeking partnerships. 
we need to work with every organization that can help us as well achieve uh, the broader impact. Now, another thing to, for success to happen, I can't sit in my comfortable office and say things. No, I have to go to these locations. So we actually go to the challenged uh, countries. So we visited, uh, you know, I'll mention a few if you want. Um, we go to um, uh, Madagascar, we go to Ghana, we go to Bangladesh, um, and, and there's a, a, a multiple list of, of places we go to. We see the problem at hand. We get information from the, the individuals and, and the organizations that have the challenge, and we come up with the solutions for them. Uh, so it's very important not to just sit in your comfortable uh, place and, and make statements. No, we are on the ground. We're walking the talk. We are. We have active activities in all of these areas that we're uh, talking about, and we want to do uh, more. So, so I think it's it's very important. And one last thing I would like to just to close with, companies. Companies is a is a is is having companies with a commercial mindset trying to help a humanitarian project is something that's very unique and, and critical to the success of this effort. If a company realizes that yes, this can fit in part of my CSR program or ESG program, that's fine. But what if you can create um, you know, commercial viable business opportunities while doing good as well? And we think you really can create a win-win situation, creating an incentive for companies to invest in projects that are um, focus on renewable solutions, but also creating the right platform for uh, these uh, companies to contribute positively to the communities that they're in. Thank you. Thank you very much for your prompt response and uh, very informative. Uh, for our last uh, presenter, we Thank have Mr. Gerard Os Osheimer from uh, USA, I will uh, continue in French. Uh, il, actuel, il occupe actuellement le poste de directeur de la compagnie ministérielle sur l'énergie propre pour l'avenir biologique aux États-Unis. Donc la compagnie ministérielle sur l'énergie propre pour l'avenir biologique vise à permettre la substitution de carburants, de produits chimiques et de matériaux biosourcés durables à leur équivalent d'origine fossile en connectant les industries biosourcées aux processus internationaux. Donc auparavant, M. Osme, Osheimer a occupé le poste de conseiller scientifique pour le département de l'agriculture des États-Unis, période pendant laquelle il a contribué à la finalisation des indicateurs de production et d'utilisation durable de la bioénergie du partenariat mondial pour la bioénergie. Il est aujourd'hui avec nous pour nous présenter une présentation autour du thème euh, révolution, sur, révolution de l'énergie de cuisson renouvelable, propre et abordable dans le contexte de l'objectif 7 des objectifs de développement durable de l'ONU à l'horizon 2030 sur l'énergie propre et abordable. Solution de carburant propre au bioéthanol pour la cuisson et potentiel pour l'Afrique. Monsieur Osteimer, vous avez 10 minutes pour faire votre exposé et merci. Thank you very much. Uh, I would first like to thank Arso for inviting me to contribute to these important conversations. And I would like to specifically thank Mr. Al Tayar, the previous speaker who did a fantastic job of uh, explaining the importance, the critical importance of um, advancing clean cooking uh, globally. And it was extremely interesting to hear uh, Saudi leadership uh, in this space. I am going to be providing a complementary technology to the LPG solar and bi biogas that uh, Mr. Al Tayar discussed. And uh, Mr. Al Tayar, if you're going to be in Dubai for COP28, then it would be wonderful to speak with you. I'm actually organizing a session at the Saudi Pavilion uh, on a different topic. But uh, if you're in Dubai, then uh, it would be wonderful to meet with you or your colleagues. Okay, I, I will be so, there, and and uh, you we'll see you at the Saudi Pavilion. Okay, wonderful. Um, uh, so great. So yeah, our, the event is on the second, but let's return to the matter at hand. Um, thank you everyone for that, allowing me to do some networking while we're on the, uh, the, the, the discussion. So I'm going to talk to you about a complementary clean cooking technology, uh, which is the use of eth ethanol. And um, again, so I don't need to start with the urgency of the situation. 
uh, as that was covered uh, very well by Mr. Altayar. Uh, and what I'm going to tell you today is that clean ethanol cooking is an effective alternative in sub-Saharan Africa. I'm going to describe how clear industry standards will enable growth of ethanol production and use. I will discuss how, um, interestingly, clean cooking is and clean ethanol cooking are becoming a priority to the international community. And I'm going to describe some tools that exist to help African countries and businesses increase their ethanol production. So first of all, uh, in terms of the, the fuel and the technology, something to, uh, to, to stress is, or something to emphasize is the the negative impacts of the uh, indoor smoke on human health, uh, typically for women and children. And so one uh, useful attribute of cooking with ethanol uh, is that it does not produce any soot. So cooking with ethanol merely produces uh, carbon dioxide and it also produces uh, water vapor. And so we breathe and exhale those without any damage. And so cooking with ethanol uh, really does help uh, with the health impacts. And so uh, bioethanol, um, something to, that's important to know is when it is a fuel, um, it has what we call a denaturant. But another way of thinking about that is this is a, a chemical that makes it completely undrinkable. So fuel ethanol uh, can be regulated quite differently than beverage uh, ethanol. And that's something that we have to raise awareness around. Uh, as I said, it's, it burns safely indoors and it's easy to dispense uh, and use as is shown on the left. Uh, stoves are, are relatively uh, simple. Uh, there's no need for uh, high pressure and uh, you can regulate the temperature uh, reasonably well. All right, uh, there are some, uh, increasingly there are commercial successes around using ethanol uh, for cooking, uh, one of which is in Kenya at the moment, in Nairobi, a company called Coco Networks. And they've now had the milestone where they're now selling ethanol to over 1 million households in Nairobi. And what they really did is they addressed the challenge of clean cooking fuel distribution. And so charcoal and uh, woody biomass and traditional biomass for cooking, there are centuries old pathways for transporting these materials. And what Coco did is they generated, and it's it's shown here, it's you could think of it as a um, as an ATM, as we would say in America, but or a cash machine or like a banking machine, in which you use your M Pesa on your cell phone and you are able to uh, electronically purchase uh, the ethanol and then it is dispensed by um, uh, an automatic machine and then you can take the ethanol to cook and that what the other thing that they did is they developed the infrastructure around um, distributing making sure that these machines um, are fully stocked with ethanol at all times uh, so that cocoa does not produce ethanol they just they just retail it and then they also retail the stoves so when we think about producing um, ethanol uh, here I'm showing from sugarcane uh, that would be the dominant feedstock in uh, Africa. And uh, you obviously, you need to grow the sugar cane. Uh, you need to harvest the sugar cane. You grind the sugar cane. And from that, you get a couple of different products, one of which is the pure sugar, uh, which usually has sufficient value that you don't ferment that into um, alcohol. But then you also have leftover um, molasses. And so this is after you've uh, you reduced the volume of the sugar juice, sugar has crystallized out, you remove the crystal sugar, that condensed sugar rich solution, uh, it makes an excellent substrate for fermentation. Uh, so um, something I wanna point out is that the UN uh, United Nations Industrial Development Organization uh, is very much uh, supporting the growth of ethanol cooking in Africa, as I'll explain further. But they've actually prepared this incredibly helpful um, flowchart for how one can go about and enabling um, clean cooking. And so one has to develop both uh, industrial policy and agricultural policy. And 
one has to take into account land use, food security, land rights, et cetera, and other environmental impacts. But, but once you, uh, but other people have done this, and as I will show you, there are many tools to help you uh, do this, then you can set in motion um, a positive, uh, a feed forward loop where you start recruiting people to the sector, you start recruiting financing to the sector, and then you can get to the point where you have uh, considerable market uh, development. And from any given uh, uh, sugar mill and, and ethanol plant, you'll be producing ethanol, you'll be producing uh, sugar, and you'll be producing electricity because the leftover uh, woody material from the sugar cane uh, known as, as the gas uh, can be burned and used to produce heat and um, electrical power. So uh, as, was po sorry, as was pointed out here, you know, we need market standards for bioethanol to establish uh, uh, the, to improve the ability to, to trade and to improve um, consumer and policymaker confidence in the fuel. So uh, something that has happened is that, um, as I said, harmonized standards uh, in South Sub-Saharan Africa would help. As I said, they would facilitate quality control, consistent production, and increased trade. Uh, it should be noted that the in Africa, the African Energy Regulation Board has established standards for bioethanol production and blending for transportation fuel. However, there is no such standard for ethanol cooking. So my understanding is that Pivot in concert with ARSO um, is working to put forward a new ASTM standard, ASTM E3050, and that this would uh, go a long way to providing the um, confidence in this uh, product. Okay, so uh, apologies for the noise. I'm at another conference and trying to find a quiet place to work. Uh, anyway, so something that we should all consider is that clean ethanol contribute, clean ethanol cooking can contribute to achieving uh, the, the SDGs. Um, it can strengthen agriculture, which impacts SDG, the zero hunger SDG and life on the land SDG. Uh, we can improve human health, which is related to the health SDG and the, uh, I'm not sure what 11 is. Uh, and then we go on, we empower women with five and 10. We can improve livelihoods with green jobs, with no poverty and with a decent wage, reduce emissions and fight deforestation. All right. And so here, uh, drilling down on uh, SDG 7, SDG 7 seeks to ensure universal energy access, double the share of renewables and double the rate of improvement in energy efficiency. And as was pointed out nicely by Mr. Uh, by the previous speaker, um, we can uh, ensure universal uh, energy access by um, ensuring uh, access to clean coal. Um, so moving on, um, the issue is really front and center. Uh, and so shown here is uh, Fatih Parole from last month. Fatih is the chief of the International Energy Agency and uh, IEA, uh, African Union, UNIDO and others are really leaning in to point out that uh, it's the number one, uh, in their view, it's, uh, it's the number one issue, it's the number one energy issue that the continent can address and can do so quickly. And I think if we have a team approach between uh, UNIDO, uh, various organizations uh, uh, that I'll tell you about in a second, and, and friends like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, that we can make real progress. Uh, here's another. So recently at the uh, Africa Climate Summit, uh, the First Lady of Kenya, uh, her Honorable Rachel Ruto is really uh, pushing uh, the need to reduce the use of charcoal cooking, as this will be beneficial to forests and our health. And Dimfna Vanderlands uh, from the Clean Cooking Alliance uh, is uh, the Clean Cooking Alliance is one of these allies that can really advance uh, the topic. Uh, I'd like to point out that recently India launched the Global Biofuels Alliance, and um, one of the things, and I actually work closely with the Global Biofuels Alliance, and one of the things that's uh, increasingly important is that uh, the GBA is, is going to be promoting sustainable biofuels, biofuel use, especially in emerging markets, and that it's probably a lot faster to get to clean ethanol cooking than to clean ethanol for transport. I promised you uh, some tools to uh, produce uh, biofuels in a sustainable way, in a healthy way. And so uh, whether it's UNFAO, the Global Bioenergy Partnership, 
the International Energy Agency Bioenergy Technical Cooperation Program or the International Renewable Energy Agency for years. These uh, leaders in this space have been producing technical documents that will enable uh, governments to develop their sector sustainably. Um, here is, is uh, this pinwheel is showing how there are tools for uh, analysis, guide, national guidelines, and then uh, importantly, uh, assessment. Um, just one specific uh, example, uh, sort of in real time, if you will, is that the government of Kenya has a clean ethanol cooking plan, and it's really quite dramatic, their expectations for improvements in employment and earning, the environmental impact, and the, uh, the health impact. This is my last slide. And so just this, so what we'll be seeing is uh, this year at COP28 that uh, UNIDO will be um, in a sense formalizing the existence of their new council on ethanol-based clean cooking. And um, that this council now has over 15 countries that are participating and numerous technical agencies. And they will be looking to be uh, driving uh, information and knowledge sharing, capacity building, technology transfer, and um, uh, lesson sharing. And so if anyone is interested in this sector, uh, they can contact me and or I can put them in touch with uh, UNIDO, which is doing a nice job pushing this all forward. Here are my uh, contact details, and I'm happy to um, take any questions. Merci, Monsieur Gérard. Donc, euh, votre présentation présente une, une application de, de la présentation de Monsieur Taylor qu'on a vu par rapport aux solutions euh, de cuisson euh, verte et durable. Donc, on a vu les, les avantages et les applications euh, que peuvent apporter l'éthanol euh, pour donc donner des solutions durables pour la cuisson, notamment pour la protection des de, de santé des personnes et aussi euh, sa contribution à plusieurs objectifs de développement durable. On a aussi vu l'importance des normes euh, et euh, la nécessité d'élaborer de, des normes par rapport à, à ce produit-là, le bioéthanol. Dans ce contexte-là, de la contribution des objectifs de, euh, de développement euh, durable, donc, et surtout par rapport à l'objectif 7, énergie propre et d'un coût abordable, quels sont selon vous les principaux potentiels ainsi que les défis que vous voyez en Afrique Et aussi, euh, pourquoi le bioéthanol est-il important en tant que solution de carburant propre et pourquoi est-il stratégique pour l'Afrique dans les révolutions de l'énergie propre Merci pour votre réponse. Monsieur Jara, avez-vous entendu la question? I, I'm happy to take a question. I don't uh, see any uh, input. Uh, I, I said, uh, donc, in your regards, I, I will try to, to translate in English the, the, the question. In regards to objective seven about energy yes. uh, development, what are the potential that you see in Africa in regards to ODD number seven? And Uh, why the bioethanol is important uh, as a solution uh, to green uh, carburant in Africa. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Um, you know, I think actually it was very fortuitous that we had the previous speaker, um, uh, Mr. Al Tayad, and then myself, because the truth is is that different places will benefit from different technologies. So for example, in a urban situation where you have better transportation logistics, it might be easier to move uh, LPG canisters around, for example. But in a rural situation where there is need for both jobs and there is the available land, then one could imagine that uh, a clean ethanol cooking solution could be really um, could be really uh, productive and really helpful for the SDG7 because 
uh, these different technologies, could, solar, ethanol, LPG, can all work together to achieve the universal energy access um, that we that we that we require. When one thinks about ethanol, though, one should really be thinking about uh, uh, the jobs that can be created, and in particular, the rural jobs. And so, uh, it's in uh, because you need jobs not just growing the crops, but you also need jobs, technical jobs in the biorefineries to produce um, the fuel. And let me just add one more thing, which is that right now the challenge for uh, challenge for African agriculture is that the price of production in Africa tends to be higher than the price of production in places like France or the United States or Canada. Or, and so the result is that it's easier to import grain to Africa than it is to produce its own grain. And this is backwards. I mean, Africa has the land, they have the knowledge, they have the capacity, they should be growing their own grain. And especially as the population increases, Africa should be growing more of its own uh, food supply. And it seems backwards, but it turns out that if you increase the demand, if you create the market for the product, then people will invest and will improve the production practices. And so we, we have lots of evidence from the United States and from Brazil and from Thailand where creating a biofuel sector, you end up with more food than you started. And I invite people to look into this and I'm, I'm very, very happy to continue that conversation. But the benefits, the benefits from biofuels are, are the combination of um, providing the energy access, providing the clean fuel, and providing an opportunity for rural economic development. Thank you for your response and for all the information. Uh, My pleasure. Thank you. Donc, euh, nous arrivons, donc, euh, euh, nous avons déroulé donc, les six présentations qui étaient euh, programmées. Donc, nous arrivons euh, à la section où on répond euh, à vos questions et réponses euh, donc, que vous avez pu saisir au niveau euh, de la section euh, questions et réponses dans Zoom. Euh, donc, j'ai déjà là trois questions que j'ai pu noter. Euh, certains donc, ont été euh, répondus, euh, notamment par rapport à la question est-ce que le Maroc a-t-il une commission euh, électrotechnique nationale qui travaille avec les CIO et la SEC Donc, euh, on a répondu à cette question. Donc, il, euh, le comité marocain électrotechnique et l'organe euh, national qui représente le Maroc auprès des instances comme l'IEC, la CNELEC, l'instance technique euh, internationale et régionale de normalisation. Euh, J'ai aussi une autre question par rapport euh, à, à, aux références de 19 normes euh, qui étaient citées, je pense, au niveau de la présentation euh, de, des énergies renouvelables. Donc, au niveau de, je pense, de la direction d'efficacité énergétique. Donc, si vous avez des, des demandes, vous, vous pouvez les adresser soit à l'Imanor et on pourra donc vous adresser des, euh, des informations par rapport à ces normes-là. Normes euh... Je ne sais pas si donc le... Le représentant de l'ARSO a noté d'autres questions. Donc, on peut, ou bien si vous avez une question, vous pouvez lever la main et la poser. Je, je ne vois pas de main qui sont levés. Donc, je crois qu'on peut passer, donc, le, avant de, de, de finir cette session, donc, je souhaiterais euh, donner l'opportunité, une fois encore, à nos chers panélistes euh, de, de une minute ou quelques recommandations par rapport à ce webinaire, le thème 
et les discussions qui ont eu lieu, euh, quelques phrases par rapport euh, au thème de, et aux présentations, euh, vos finales perspectives. Donc, euh, si vous souhaitez, je donne la parole euh, au premier panéliste, M. Peter de Larso, si vous voulez bien prendre la parole, si vous avez des, des perspectives. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to conclude my presentation uh, in, by saying that in terms of uh, growth in uh, sustainable energy for Africa, in addition to the structural training, workshops and events, as well as uh, assessing the LPG supply chain, I also believe that a robust quality infrastructure is key in ensuring that uh, We, we move towards a just energy transition in Africa. And also, this will enable conformity, competition, and connection across Africa and internationally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, if we have uh, Mr. Ahmed, quelques derniers mots pour conclure. Monsieur Ahmed. En attendant, Monsieur Ahmed, donc euh, je passe Madame Diori. Est-ce que vous avez quelques derniers mots pour conclure? You, you have, you have, you have more than one Mohammed. So if, if you just tell us, tell us the last uh, names. <laughs> with, uh, uh, it's the Mr. Mohammed Ahmed uh, from the direction of uh, efficiency, uh, renewable energy, the second panelist. I will follow the order. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Dury, if you have final words, conclusion from the, the presentations and the discussions. I just wanted to wrap up by saying uh, thank you to uh, Imanor and Arso for organizing this webinar and for the great attendance. And I'm available. I can share my email in the chat if you, anyone needs further information on R&D and innovation in the energy sector in Morocco specific, specifically or in the African context. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Huari, if you have final words to wrap up. Uh, I would like also to thank all the organizers and the, the attendees to this uh, uh, important, uh, let's say, web meeting. And uh, my, 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 maybe my recommendation is that we have to focus on the, uh, on um, renewable energy and energy efficiency uh, technologies and uh, the projects, decentralized projects, uh, which would be very suitable for uh, the application in African countries, but also in the world. I mean, all decentralized projects, uh, including or using renewable energy for their uh, energy supply is, uh, is, is, is the most effective way to, to have this, uh, let's say, to cover all the needs on energy, energy uh, supply in, in this country. And, and for, plus we have uh, African countries, they, we have uh, a lot of uh, rural energy uh, potential uh, than other uh, countries. So, so, so we have all the, the, the ingredients and all the, let's say, uh, the reasons to, to, to to go to, to this uh, way. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's true with the potential of uh, Africa in terms of renewable energy. Uh, I think the, the future of energy in Africa must be uh, from renewable resources indeed. Uh, for our fifth panelist, uh, if uh, Mr. Uh, Mohammed Atayat, Do you have some final words, some conclusion? You have to uh, yes, uh, again, thank you for the organizers for uh, including me in this very rich panel and very, um, info it's been very informative. 
uh, one one reflection is that I think if we just look at the African continent and the collection of African cultures and traditions and capabilities, I'm very I feel very um, inspired. I feel that uh, there are so many opportunities to create positive impact in in and the twist to this story is we do it through collaboration and through positive partnership. Um, so I, I, again, thank you for allowing us to share our story and our ambition in, in terms of Saudi Arabia. We welcome partnerships from anywhere uh, around the world to help us uh, push this um, you know, new initiative forward. And I, I'm really excited to see what great things all of my colleagues in the panel uh, will be doing in the future. So thank you again for having us and much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for your words. Uh, and finally, uh, Mr. Gerard, uh, sorry if I mis mispronounced your noun earlier. Uh, do you have some final words, some conclusion you would like to share with us? Hello. Okay, uh, so I think we lost uh, Mr. Gerard. Uh, I would like also to thank the participants. I see there is still 100, more than 106 person still with us. We uh, took some uh, uh, extra time because the, the program was, was uh, uh, charged very rich in the presentations. Uh, thank you all, also for the panelists and the organizer. Uh, the host and co-host. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to uh, the representative of ARSO to uh, continue with this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, once more to the participants for staying this long. It has been a great opportunity for sharing because energy, energy and energy, electricity is what we need for Africa's industrialization, for socioeconomic development, and also to address the climate change issues as per the SDGs uh, goal uh, seven and uh, Goal six and seven of Agenda 2063. We have come to the final end. We want to thank the panelists for that rich discussions. And on behalf of the ARSO Secretary General, I want to take this opportunity uh, to thank you all and to welcome uh, our co-host, uh, Mr. Abderrahim Taibi, to make a, a small final remarks and a word of uh, uh, goodbye to the panelists and also to the uh, participants. Uh, Mr. Taibi, please. Mr. Taibi, votre micro il est éteint. Mr. Taibi, votre micro. Monsieur Taibé, on ne vous entend pas. D'accord. Monsieur Okongo, est-ce que, est que vous pouvez donner le droit à Monsieur Taibé d'activer le micro C'est bon. Désolé, j'avais un problème de connexion par mon micro. Uh, donc, colleague, euh, voilà, c'est au terme de, cette, de ce webinaire qui est très important. Je voudrais tout d'abord remercier Larso d'avoir bien voulu nous donner cette occasion pour partager euh, l'expérience marocaine avec euh, les autres collègues africains. Je remercie aussi euh, les panélistes, les panélistes aussi bien 
les panélistes marocains que nos collègues de, du SASO, de l'ANSI, de, 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 de l'ARSO, qui ont aussi co contribué à l'enrichissement de, 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 des thèmes abordés aujourd'hui. C'est un début pour nous, l'énergie, c'est très important. C'est un point commun qui peut nous réunir ensemble en tant qu'organisme de normalisation au sein de l'ARSO pour faire, je dirais, des offres, des propositions concrètes qui pourraient contribuer à cette dynamique énergétique, bien sûr, au service de nos pays, de notre continent, mais également de nos populations qui en souffrent énormément. Et nous, nous, nous demeurerons toujours à la disposition de, de l'ARSO et de nos collègues d'autres de, 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 organismes africains de normalisation pour travailler ensemble, main dans la main, pour relever ce défi qui est un défi commun et trouver des solutions communes. Donc je vous donne rendez-vous à notre webinaire en 2024 en collaboration avec, avec l'ARSO. Le, 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 et en, merci encore une fois et à bientôt. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Taibi. And I think uh, we are coming to the end of this. I can just share my screen a bit. Uh, once we are coming to the end, uh, we just wish to highlight, these are some activities that are happening at Imanor. If you remember standardization, standardization, standardization. And Anor has done a good work. Uh, we want to highlight the 69th Council meeting, and we want to thank uh, the Standards Organization of Nigeria for hosting, which is happening next week. And some of the discussions that will be happening is what we have gone through since January in the webinar sessions, the recommendations, and how far and how we have uh, treated the recommendations that have come from these webinar sessions. So it is a great opportunity and we don't take it for granted about our final webinar of today that we have held. And it is part also of the discussions that will take place next week about uh, the feedback that we are giving back to the council. Uh, uh, we have a fully packed 2024 uh, webinar sessions. Uh, we are targeting to reach our 50th uh, webinar session by November 27th, 2024. So we still uh, will be reaching out to the countries. Already we have sent out a uh, appeal for co-hosting where we are going to get more deeper information what is happening on the various themes and topics and also to bring the international uh, stakeholders to share, to give us highlights and to open opportunities like we have had today from uh, ANSI and USA and also from uh, Saudi Arabia partnerships that we need uh, to address the issues that affect us in different ways. So with that, I want to thank you very much and call on uh, uh, our uh, the panelists who are still here. If we can have a, a photo session, I ask Mr. Dan, our ITC, uh, those who are able to put on their cameras kindly so that we finalize this we finalize this session uh, uh, with a, a photo. It is our final webinar session. Kindly, all of us, uh, our ITC department, Mr. Dan, if you can take those who are able to put their cameras on, please. We thank you very much. Those who are able to put on their cameras, We thank you very much. I think uh, that one marks the end of our session. It was uh, very important, very good. And uh, we thank Morocco once more for accepting to be our final co-hosting in terms of the 2023 webinar sessions that we have been having since January 2023, 20, uh, started with Kenya, then Cameroon as we progressed. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Secretary General, uh, Dr. Hemogen Sengemana, we thank you so much. And we look forward to having more sessions in 2024 from January to November. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.
Bye. Thank you. Bye.